What's up, Living Soil Nerds? Happy Wednesday to you. Uh, we got another show that um, you know kind of came last minute. Unfortunately, we had a guest that had to move some things around. Uh, so I was asking Marco, like, do you want to talk about topics? And he said isopods. So um, I, I was amazed, actually, when we announced this, how many of you have reached out to me already uh, talking about that, you know, you wanted to learn more about these. So I've gone out of my way uh, to get a variety of different isopods from all over the world. Uh, most of these are considered more uh, like designer isopods, uh, but I also have a few and can talk about a bunch of the ones that are used more for like a common purpose uh, cleanup crew. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes that uh, obviously takes to uh, build a company. So if you guys want to talk about that as well, um, you know, when I was uh, I guess it was more like the end of 2019, you know, I got kicked in the chin. Uh, I, there was a lot of stuff that happened to me behind the scenes that, you know, I, I'm, ha I'm actually grateful for now uh, because it made me start thinking of some things that I saw niches that I that I had noticed uh, back in the day. And one of those was when I first started playing around with isopods. I got the zebra isopod and I started putting it on my old uh, 303 organic cannabis account. I also started putting it on uh, this thing called Doobie, uh, which was around here in Denver at the time. Um, and so I was able to have a large account on Doobie as well. And I noticed that more and more individuals had never seen a roly poly and isopod like that. Uh, so that's kind of where all of that started. Uh, I want to let my co-host kind of uh, talk about some things. But uh, yeah, I mean, the, the isopods for me was, you know, another way, another outlet uh, to believe in yourself and make a little money so that you don't have to rely on others. Uh, and that was something, unfortunately, for a long time without a college education. You know, you're always working for the suits and it always feels like there's just some bullshit going on behind the scenes. Uh, and probably 95 percent of the time with with most companies, there is bullshit going on behind the scenes. And we've talked about that to endless. I'm not I'm not trying to harp on that. I just want you guys to remember that uh, we got to think of each other. We got to look out for each other. Um, and so a lot of this stuff is maybe more let's find and fine tune our soil skills so that we can find little niches and make money for ourselves, uh, whether it's in cannabis or outside of cannabis. Yeah, man, definitely. I like, um, I love the growth. I want to say happy Wednesday to everybody. Thanks for joining in on another show. Hit that like button. Um, definitely, man, I've been seeing that growth. You've been on, you know, last couple of years, Brian. And, um, you know, isopods are something that, you know, if you're, you know, grow with soil or kind of the natural way or even outdoors in your garden, I mean, everybody's seen those. And it's probably something that's kind of, you know, seen and not really, um, you know, noticed a lot, you know, until you really start digging into the soil and the soil food web and the different shredders and the different diversity of species that we always talk about. Um, then you start appreciating kind of the isopods. Unfortunately, a lot of people's first, you know, kind of experience with them is either they don't notice them or they have a problem with them. And I think a lot of people get it confused because I didn't even realize, you know, of course, we know there's a lot of different species, but until uh, dealing with you, man, I didn't realize some are special. Some eat more protein, some do more cleanup. You know, there's different ones and, and different types. So I'm looking forward to this show where you can kind of, um, you know, get into it a little bit and explain to folks, you know, I guess, why don't you start out kind of just, you know, what's the purpose? You know, why, what, what, what different uses do we have for isopods? You know, kind of where do you see them being used and, you know, where do you um, think kind of the future of them is and kind of go from there? Well, uh, I'll, thank you, Marco. I, I think a lot of this is coming from my experience and understanding more about the reptile world. You know, we've mentioned this a couple of times. Um, it's, it's, you know, they, they say bioactive, we say living soil. So we're, we're all kind of saying the same thing. Uh, but the beauty is, is that that bioactive side of things in the reptile world, that is just barely starting to take off. I, I mean, like, you know, veterans in the reptile community don't really even understand soil systems. So to understand and uh, show them bioactive systems, you know, kind of show off different things where you're using a variety of the soil food web. Uh, you're, you know, when we go to these expos, I got these little demonstrations and stuff. We give talks. Uh, so more individuals are starting to see that instead of them having to smell the defecation from the, the reptile, there's ways to create a bioactive setup that is basically self-contained. You know, every now and then you might need to add a little bit of calcium and that kind of thing. But for the most part, isopods uh, feed, you know, strictly speaking, on the bearded dragon. Um, I, that's almost all that I feed the uh, the dragon itself. And if you ever have owned one of those reptiles, you know that that's an expensive animal to own because they're constantly eating. Um, they usually eat like crickets. So that was kind of the, 
I guess the norm thought back in the day. Uh, the reality is when you buy crickets, when you bring them home, probably, you know, 50 percent of them are still alive. When they die, they smell. Uh, so then the community moved on to these things called dubia roaches, which are a little more hardier. Uh, they're not all dying when you're buying them. The problem is that those also smell. And again, they're roaches. So not everybody's into that. So here comes is that those know, big. Is that those big roaches, Brian, that you see? Yeah, uh, man, they're probably about that big. They're considered okay. a feeder. So, again, this is all kind of stuff that I saw. Uh, never really putting it together. I had mentioned it to a friend. And uh, to be honest, that person made fun of me. So I. I guess I thought selling isopods at that time just wasn't, you know, maybe, maybe I should never tell, you know, they say never tell people those kind of things. Cause if somebody says that to you, then you, you're like, ah, yeah, that was a dumb idea. Uh, but luckily for me, I uh, kept thinking those things through, man. And like I said, with, uh, with the zebra isopods, uh, armadillium, um, macu, what are those? Uh, maculatum. I think I'm saying that right, man. I, you know, I suck with the Latin stuff. Uh, but th those are the ones that I first started with. And like I said, I noticed that individuals started to reach out to me. Where did you get those? Um, so I started to play around with them. I only had like maybe 15. Um, I had ordered them from a company in Germany. Uh, I think I had ordered like 50 of them and, you know, most of them died. But, uh, th you know, that's part of the risk, I guess. You know, so I got those. Uh, nothing really happened with that. Uh, a few a few years went by, actually, after I got those zebras. Um, and then when COVID hit, I started to think about ways to make money and, uh, you know, what, what's really um, something that I can take care of my family. You know, at that time, even my wife and I were talking about having a, a third child. So it's like, OK, well, how am I going to be able to take care of, you know, another child? We already have obviously two um, and still be able to be there for my children and, and not work for other individuals where I feel like when, when a lot of the hard work is done, uh, there's bullshit going on behind the scenes where, you know, you don't even really understand what's going on because people start looking at you different. You know, you don't really it, it's a weird feeling, man, when you're in there and you're, you're supposedly everybody's family and people, you know, behind their back are, are not family. Uh, so that's, you know, everything that I was thinking about at the kitchen table when COVID was going gone. And so then again, I started to think about isopods and how people were pretty into it. And so I really started to research some of that stuff. Uh, I reached out to my wife. We started talking about it uh, and it was I don't know. I, I wouldn't say she laughed it off at first, but we definitely like didn't jump right into it. Um, and then I started to, to kind of talk about some things. I, I discovered something called a rubber ducky, uh, which is a famous isopod. Um, that was it's basically the species known as Cubaris species. Uh, it's a brand new species pretty much for an isopod world. It was discovered in 2018. So there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of newness to this. There's a lot of uh, people that don't understand how to get the Cubar species uh, to produce uh, or, or really at any high level of any reproduction rates that seem like anything works. There, you know, there's so many different uh, ideas. Kind of reminds me again of you know when you're first getting into living soil. You know, everybody kind of had their own idea. Some people said it didn't work. Some people said, yeah, do this. I've noticed again. Granted, they, they um, live in the caves of Thailand. I still give them a, a living soil system. That's the substrate that they're on. They love to burrow. Uh, they, they go down like four to five inches on that. So a lot of the individuals, when they first get rubber duckies, myself included, you think they're all dead until you, you, know, you start scraping because you think you're going to change out the substrate and you realize that they're all down there mating. Uh, so there's a lot to learn with this kind of stuff. And um, my wife and I kind of just sat, I mean, I think we've said this a lot, man. In 2020, if you didn't uh, better yourself, you know, it's kind of shame on you because it was a year of uh, I've always heard the term jubilee where you get to kind of just sit around. There wasn't too much going on. Uh, so what did you do with your time? And um, what I learned is uh, not not just myself, but a lot of people in the cannabis industry, people that even wanted to do seeds. I see a lot of people in cannabis doing more like logos and stuff. It seemed like those individuals stepped up and created a, a little business for themselves. Uh, and hats off to everybody that is a business owner. I mean, especially being an entrepreneur where everything's on you, uh, that can be scary at times. There's a lot of highs and lows with that. But uh, that's kind of the fun aspect of this. And when I was a young man working at the Ford Plantation, where a lot of uh, very, very influential people have their like third or fourth home, um, those individuals were always talking about you need to enjoy the journey. And so that's something else that I'm constantly trying to remind myself that the highs and lows are part of it. And uh, taking it to the next level is you know, uh, being proactive. And so I 
took over a year to start to breed these things out, Marco, before I really even mentioned any of this stuff uh, to anybody outside of my wife. Yeah, man, that's um. I'm just checking out the website. You do have a great site, man. You've been doing really well with that, and that's um. That's the rubber ducky right there that he was talking about. Look how wild that is! Like, just to see some of some some isopods like that in your living soil. I mean, that's awesome. That's an awesome compliment. It seems like to you know to cannabis, you know, or anything you may be growing, especially indoors. Now, just for instance. If I get these rubber duckies and I put them in my living soil, theoretically, they should just live and reproduce, right? As long as we're keeping our temperatures, you know, we don't let it freeze out or something like that. Should just continue to propagate. Yeah, I would, I would say since the uh, the price point and the reproduction rates of the rubber ducky, you know, a lot of we sell this to a lot of individuals and they, they refer to this as like the Louis Vuitton of isopod. Um, so when you first get into this, I would put it in a vivarium or a terrarium so you can kind of keep track of things. You want them to be a little bit closer than normal when they first start out uh, so that they do reproduce. Um, and the, the, the reason why they're, uh, you know, considered kind of pricey is because of all of the hard things that I had mentioned. You know, if it's hard to get them to reproduce, that's where the price points come in. Or if they're not uh, around often. You know, some of these species are being discovered like every few months, it seems like, especially the ones in Thailand, uh, the Cubaris. So there's um, potentially endless uh, isopods that keep popping up. And more and more individuals are seeing this more of like a Pokemon type thing. Uh, they collect a lot of these. And uh, that's where I'm trying to fill that niche. You know, our goal is to have over 100 different species here uh, by the end of the summer. Yeah, that's a great um, that's a great goal, man. And, I, and I'm definitely uh, I love it because. And I'm thinking, I'm just asking and kind of telling at the same time, but so if I have three, four, five different types of isopods, diversity, now, I guess it's possible to achieve, you know, where each, each, um, each type that you get feeds on something different or has a different job within the same living soil. Is that possible? Yeah. Now, like the lower end ones, those are usually more of like the cleanup crews. So, you, you know, okay. you can add a variety of those in there. They're going to be eating the animal's defecation. They're going to eat the animal shedding and they're also a food source. So, again, that's where my uh, little business comes into play is because once people that own reptiles realize that they can create a master culture, like um, Ken was just showing that starter kit there, um, they can create that master culture. Let those things uh, take up to where there's hundreds in just a few weeks. And now from that main master culture, they can feed a variety of different reptiles without ever having to spend money on that. Again, that's how prolific these isopods are. Now, those are called the dairy cows. Now, uh, you know, a, a rubber ducky, some of those, especially when they're juveniles, can take a year, year and a half before they're even adults ready to breed. Um, so, again, it's really understanding what isopods you're working with and there's so many isopods from all over the world that um and, and not enough information to be honest so that's what we hope to be able to continue uh, educating on and we're learning as we go i mean there's hardly any books on there i mean there's just a couple um, and then there's really hardly any information out there marco i mean there's mm -hmm. or maybe i should say there's not as good information like a lot of them are saying use dry uh basically dead substrate um, and some of those individuals uh, have even been my competition that now are using my soil uh, so that their isopods don't don't die uh, from show to show. Um, and, you know, I guess in hindsight, I think that's that they're using a, a dry substrate, a mm -hmm. dead substrate. There's no microbial mm -hmm. life in there. Um, and I think the isopods enjoy the microbial life just as much as plants. Um, and then when you're adding um, you know, extra things to feed them that's when you're really getting the colors to pop. Uh, you're adding the chitin to really make sure that this, the uh, exoskeleton is a little bit larger than your, than your competition as well. And all of that, again, is just coming down to the soil food web, man. We're just using basic things that we used to feed plants uh, and feeding them to the decomposers. Yeah, I feel like, you know, a lot of people say, you know, books. Is there a book on that? You know, some of this stuff... I feel like you're front lines on this. You know what I mean? Obviously, isopods are millions of years old, but to take them and now bring them into these um, living soil systems, these bio active systems and, you know, kind of understand their value. You know, to me, that's next level. To me, we're writing the book as you speak, you know, like 
those guys use, you know, you probably, you know, sawdust or whatever the typical bedding, cheap bedding is. You come in, now you're busting off of the IMO and the living beddings. You know, now we're understanding that, you know, why would you put something living into a sterile, you know, non-living environment? You know, it just doesn't make sense. So even maybe there could be books out there, but a lot of the things, you know, we're taking minds from two different you know, disciplines, you know, from gardening to rep the reptile world. And we're kind of putting them together in certain ways, the way they make sense, you know. So some of these things aren't something where you can say, hey, man, where did you read that? Well, you know, I'm, I didn't read that. I'm trying this and it works and I'm explaining it to you and telling you what I did, you know. So a lot of it is having to do with open mind, man. And, um, and I think that's where, you know, you've been kind of stepping it up, taking it to the next, next level. And I think that is, um, it's very flattering, right? That now all of a sudden everybody's really understanding the living's part of it. They're trying to, you know, also get on board with that. So, um, you know, teaching by doing, guys. You know, that man is doing it a certain way, and it seems to be working. Now that's that he's when he's doing that, he's teaching. You know, he's showing you what he's doing. So, um, I, you know, I like that man. I think it's great. I think you got a good, solid business. I didn't realize the reptile world was so huge, man. Like. It's just, yeah. What up, Chad? The reptile world is so big, you know, and, and there's so much um, room for growth. And I think for me, animal health is where you will excel and, and people that are focused on that living aspect. You know, your vivarium, your terrarium will be much more healthy. Your animal will be much more healthy. Shit, man, you got a gecko or a Parsons chameleon or a panther or whatever type of chameleon five ten g's man i mean you wouldn't you wouldn't treat an expensive car you know badly or or not wash it or not maintain it so same way as you got an expensive animal or something that you've got invested a lot of time into it's worth going that extra bit for that living aspect i think yeah and you know it there's a variety of things uh you know when, especially when it comes to the chameleons you know when they're defecating all the time you would have to pay your employees to clean that up especially the the bearded dragons as well if you have a store uh those when those things defecate it is uh noticeable um so you know if if they miss the little green carpet that you put out now you got to clean the whole bottom thing and that was it seems like that was the norm for decades uh so now when people are seeing that um you can use mother nature to break down mother nature, the same kind of stuff. That's the, I mean, these are really uh, like parallel, parallel universes here, Marco. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just the fact that it seems like we know so much more being cannabis farmers than anybody in the reptile game. And so that's why I wanted, again, you know, we talked about it, you know, a couple of times on other shows. I want to kind of give you guys that, I mean, I'm not saying you guys isopods might not be your thing or, uh, you know, might not be, it might be pretty hard to catch up to me. So there's other shit out there that, that you can find ways to make money. I mean, just making your own soil system, uh, you could probably sell that to the reptile crew uh, very easily because the stuff that that's out there, um, you know, they think Fox Farm is like, you know, the Rolls Royce of, of soil. And so it reminds me of how we used to discuss things a decade ago or a decade plus ago where we were trying to reuse our soil systems, build a super soil uh, but we, again, we just didn't understand enough. So we were using, we were still using commercial bagged soil. So we're having a lot of fungus snap problems. We're having a lot of deficiency problems. And they are also having those same issues, especially when it comes to the chameleon tanks, uh, because they do want to spend, you know, when someone spends money on a chameleon, I mean, they're, they're dropping money on that. And that's something else I noticed, Marco, is that the reptile community just seems like they realize that things are expensive. And I've seen individuals that look like they didn't have two nickels to rub together drop, you know, $10,000 on a snake. Um, so this is another world where it's kind of like the same way we were, where people kind of uh, maybe misjudge individuals sometimes about their goals and what they're after. And um, I treat everybody, you know, the same way like we used to with cannabis. Um, and I, you know, I don't think that's a secret or anything. I just noticed that not everybody in the reptile community is nice. Uh, there's some individuals that are just complete assholes. Uh, even at the show last weekend, there was a gentleman that owns this big thing out of Florida that came out uh, and, and he was beating his animals like right in front of everybody. So, uh, the, you know, some of that stuff is kind of uh, eye opening to me because I wouldn't have imagined that somebody would feel that comfortable to, you know, beat a goat and beat sheep and stuff. And I, I realized those aren't um, always the, the animals that uh, listen uh, but at the same time, in front of kids, it just seemed uh, 
uh, inappropriate. Damn, what was that? Um, like at a petting zoo or something? Yeah, like, man. And uh, you wow. should have seen the price. Also, the guy, he, he he goes up to these two younger kids. I would say they're probably like maybe nine or 10, 10, 11. He says, hey, do you guys want to pet an alligator? Yeah, absolutely. All right, 20 bucks each. I okay. Thought that was, I thought that was kind of messed up, too. Okay, like, scumbag. I got kid, you. Dude. Yeah, he, he's on that scumbag level, you know. <laughs> so that those people are there, too. Uh, right. But I think that's why, um, you know, if you're, if you're doing things correctly, or I, I think if you're showing individuals how to improve their own business, even with snakes, you know, having uh, the dairy cows break down their shedding so that individuals don't have to go in there and clean the cages. Um, now the whole snake community is more understanding of bioactive. So uh, a lot of opportunity for people that um, know how to make soil. I mean, I'm I'm just one individual. I'm reaching out to a few people. So uh, there's going to be some uh, things behind the scenes being revealed here soon. Uh, but to, to take it to the next level, uh, you know, a lot of you guys in the community can ride this wave, you know, with me. Uh, the more, the merrier, you know, I mean, even with the isopods, like I'm I enjoy the, the competition. And if you guys want to get into it, I encourage it. I mean, there's, yeah, you're a national brand, but at the same time, you know, you know, you can't reach out to everybody. So if there's ways for you guys to make a little money for yourself doing this too, hey, you know, um, I, I will say it's not easy and it's not cheap uh, to, to get going with this stuff. Um, but if you're dedicated and you see potential, uh, then this is something that, um, you know, might also make sense. I've also started growing like sensitive plants and, you know, selling pitcher plants, Marco, like anything that's kind of more carnivorous and bioactive. Uh, you know, individuals have never seen that, especially this weekend. You touch the sensitive plant and it folds up. Uh, mm -hmm. Most people had never seen that before. So kind of I like the shock and awe of some of this stuff where people can see that plants actually do know that you're around. And, uh, you know, that we're, there is an energy to this, especially when we're growing things. And a lot of that comes down to just kind of how you carry yourself and uh, how you carry your brand. Yeah, man. Brand and a lot of things, you know, and what you got to do is. Folk, you know, Brian said, ride that wave. Yeah, ride that wave. But you got to come with quality, too. You have to put in the time. You have to test out what you're doing. You got to, you know, if you're going to say it works for reptiles, then you need to you should have a reptile tank or you should have somebody testing your stuff. Like, you know, the world's got enough of the old just I can make this thing. So now I can I feel I have the right to sell it like that's fine. But you know, if you want longevity, if you want to really step step up, you know, you got to focus on that quality. You got to have the best. You got to have the best, healthiest. You got to ship your shit. It's got to arrive on time. Like all that takes time. And for, I would suggest for people when you're shipping things, when you're starting out in a new business, maybe just start out shipping some free samples to folks. See how your packaging works. See, did it make it all right? Did it bust up? Did it Those are up? bars right there. Yeah, you know, that shipping thing's a big deal, man, because there's a lot of um, things that you it, it, you would think that the mail is not that rough on your stuff, but it, it is. It'll put you to the test. And one thing about, about the way Brian ships is um, they do cardboard box. And then within that, there's also like foam, like, uh, st you know, styrofoam protection inside of that, which is insulation as well. Um, when he, when I got his packages, they weren't crushed. They were all intact. They were good to go. You know, that, all that means a lot. Um, and I will say this, the mail will deliver anything you send. Um, they busted a FAA that I sent to my, my buddy Garrett, and they literally put the busted flat package of FAA in a Ziploc and still delivered it to him. So, um, you know, work on your shipping is, is a big thing. Super gold bars, man. I even had to learn that you don't ship out on Mondays because there's been a law because of Sunday. So you ship out on Tuesday so that all your stuff goes out. Uh, oh. Because when I first started shipping out on Monday, packages were being late and delayed and stuff. I couldn't figure out why the hell that was happening. Oh, because they got they had all the traffic from probably Saturday, Friday, if it didn't make it. And then here comes Monday and it's loaded up. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I always ship Tuesday as well. And mainly because I take that Sunday and Monday to kind of get I like to get my stuff together. And then that Tuesday, I'm ready to hit it. And there's a dramatically noticeable difference between USPS and USP, UPS excuse me, uh, and FedEx. Uh, so if you're selling or, or moving like a high-end animal or something that you want, like with rubber duckies, we usually send that FedEx or uh, overnight UPS. 
yes. um, because we just don't trust uh, the mail. And I've even had uh, this one gentleman uh, flip the shit in front of me. It says like live animals, all this stuff. We pay uh, like an extra dollar or something per box, which doesn't sound like a lot, but that's a lot when you're buying yeah. like, a thousand boxes. Uh, it's for it to say reptile and all that stuff, live animal. And he is literally like flicking them, flinging them, you know, into the bin in front of me. So I had to sternly and hopefully politely be like, look, man, you know, this is my business. Right. He said he didn't see it, but, you know. Yeah, whatever. Nobody gives a damn. You know, so that's where shipping, like getting back to Marco was saying, really comes into play. And if you could uh, ship some samples or something, you could figure out the time it takes to get places and um, it will never be the same. You can ship the same package every Tuesday to the same person. And more than likely it would never like kind of, you know, maybe a day sooner or a day later. So you kind of have to learn that kind of stuff too. Uh, what's the temperature going to be like, not only on the day that you think is going to be shipped there, but what if it is delayed? What's the next day? Is it extremely hot? Well, then you probably do need to pay for a cold pack. Uh, all of those little things matter because, um, isopods are extremely uh finicky and the the higher they are the more expensive they are the more finicky they are yeah because you're talking about animals that evolved a lot of them in caves or you know they live in caves their life cycle is in a cave think of a cave what more, what is more consistent in temperature you know really than a cave so yeah that, that makes a lot of sense some of these things i imagine if the temperature fluctuated more than a couple of degrees maybe in one direction or another um could get pretty temperamental but like you said in your in your home and your in your enclosure once you got them in there usually we're keeping our temperatures you know home warm and room temperature so it should be good in there i would imagine uh, when I first got the rubber duckies, you know, I spent, well, actually when I first got rubber duckies, I spent 1500 bucks and they all arrived dead. So, um, you know, the, the reptile community has come a long way as well because now you can at least order them here in America without taking that kind of risk. Uh, but anyway, so I was keeping the, the rubber duckies at a higher humidity. Um, and I, you know, again, probably bad information. So with the Cubara species, I learned that if you do keep them in a super high uh, humidity, they have the potential to kind of like explode. Um, they, they get like water or something, and then they, you'll just see like a little rubber ducky, like a bomb went off. Uh, so when these things are, you know, each little one is worth like 20, 25 bucks, uh, you can't be having five and six of these things passing away every week. Uh, so a lot of this, again, comes down to paying attention, you know, attention to detail is extremely paramount uh, with this if you want to be successful uh, because you know a week in a plant's life is a long time a week in an isopod's life seems like it's even longer so if you overfeed you got issues if you underfeed they're not going to keep up uh, so there's there's just a lot to it um, mm -hmm. but again it's something that I think more individuals can make money with and if you even just go the feeder route you don't even really have to uh, like it's not hard to breed a dairy cow you know, so they, they breed almost at the same rate as the dubia roaches. Again, they just don't smell and they can't climb glass. So um, that's another thing. Like they're not going to get out potentially and get all over your house or anything. So there's a lot of benefits now for the reptile community to use not only isopods, but springtails. That's a huge seller for me as well. I sell out every single time. So more individuals are starting to understand that away from just cannabis. And if you haven't used springtails in your cannabis farming, that's something else that is tried and true. If you want to break down organic matter faster, uh, you need those to work in a symbiotic relationship with the other shredders. Um, and now, Marco, I'm starting to play around with, uh, you know, more of the millipedes. I had always kind of thought that, you know, I, maybe some bad information and some things, but it seemed like the centipede, you know, you didn't want to mess with that because I don't want to get bit and go to the hospital. And then the millipede, I just didn't understand the, the same rate, I guess, back then. Uh, that the millipedes breaking down uh, almost at the same level. Some of those species or some of them are even faster. Uh, so I have a, a person I reach out to that's going to uh, give me some of those bumblebee ice, um, millipedes uh, and kind of play around with those in, in addition with the isopods and see what happens. Yeah, springtails are tried and true. And it seems like uh, that's another thing, man. If you just sold springtails, I promise you, you'd make money around the country. Because nobody that is going around to these expos can keep it in stock. So, um, again, I don't, you know, I don't ever mind sharing this kind of stuff with you. This is ways for you guys to make money. 
I know that 90% of you guys probably won't do that, you know, and I wish more of you would. But if I can get, you know, just even a couple individuals to find a way to make more money for themselves or their mm -hmm. family, that's what this whole show is about. Uh, no one ever taught me. I, I didn't feel like I had any guidance outside of bullshit guidance and uh, people teaching you really stupid ways to make money because there's really no avenue to success with that. There's no real retirement plan flip, flipping packs. Um, so when do you get out of that? You know, most people don't until they get locked up or worse. Um, so this is the kind of stuff what feels good, man, to be able to to do this and look people in the eye and uh, have them uh, want the product that, you, that you're making. And I know, Marco, you feel that way with the products you make because you're sold out instantaneous every time that you uh, you put them up on your website. Yeah, man, I do. I do. I feel I feel like that. And I, I really. I put my heart into what I do and I don't put anything out there until I know it's a hundred because I'm, I'm, I got like, you know, my word, that's I like to rock with my word. You know, that's what I go by. So, um, yeah, man, it's difficult. You know, it's like you, you as one person, you know, when you, when your stuff becomes, you know, popular and it's good and people know it, it go it sells out so quick. And sometimes I feel like, man, I can't even touch enough people with it. So right now I'm working on some things behind the scene where I'm going to be ramping up, um, you know, as far as production and being able to uh, keep things in stock because, um, you know, I know, I know a lot of people look for that and, and don't have necessarily the time to make some of these inputs, even though I wish you would um, take some time, takes a little bit of different skills and techniques, but you can learn it. Um, a lot of these things, man, like I said, just focus on the quality, make the best you can make, be your best. You can be, have your product the best. And then like that, the money part, that stuff, that, that comes like after you get that part, then, then, the, then, you know, the making the money comes. But if you just go out at it, everybody's got a calculator. You can do math. If you just start doing math and then trying to build a business around math, it's not going to be that sustainable. You know, to me, you got to build it around that brand. And Brian mentioned branding earlier, you know, letting your brand be synonymous. Like when I, your logo, very, very distinct. You know, everybody, when they see that, they know, boom, that's rubber ducky. You don't even really need to be able to read the words, you know, things like that. That's good branding. And that, that's good, um, you know, brand recognition. Well, that's right? our boy, Bobby, right there. Yeah. You know, yeah taking sorry. the time to put money into, uh, you know, a $50 logo is just that a $50 logo. So yeah, you're really building a brand for yourself. Then, um, you know, there, there's artists that make logos from scratch. And then there's artists that make logos from a template and a $50 oh. logo, I promise you is from a template. So you're going to see the same thing somewhere someday. Yeah. Bobby, Bobby will take that thing and he'll mm -hmm. take it like he made one just from the words I told him, you know, I gave him words to draw, <laughs> get me. So he can take words and make them into a picture. That's a good artist. And there's a lot of logo makers out there. Damn. I feel like there's more logo makers than damn growers these days. Like you get so many every day. Do you want a logo? No, I do not. I'm good. <laughs> you know? I get hit up for that all the time. <laughs> or you need help with your website. I'm like, no, nah, ma'am, I'm good. Yeah. I'm good to go. So here's Appreciate the thing, you, you can make your own website. You have to take a class. You have to teach yourself. But I promise you, once you understand a few of the back end stuff, uh, you can do that for yourself. Uh, and the value of that is a couple thousand dollars. Like an e-commerce website should be like twenty five hundred to probably, you know, ten thousand dollars or more, depending on how complex it is. Uh, but e-commerce sites is a, a, a fantastic way for you to find uh, a passive income, you know, Truth be told, when I do this show, sometimes I mean I'm I'm impressed uh, with the sales in those three hours. And again, once that all is set up for you, you know you can continue. You can go out there and promote. Uh, this isn't like the uh, quiet hustle days. Now we get to go out and go to the expos and let people know all about us. Um, and the how quickly that can happen when you go to these expos. Uh, I'm obviously seeing that with rubber duckies and I saw that with the cannabis expo and I would try to reach out to people. Some people even brought me in were paying me uh, for advice. And I was even telling them like, it's the expos you have to be at their educating. And they didn't listen to that aspect. Um, so when people are asking me like, okay, well, how are you able to do this so successfully? Again, it's, we're using the same blueprint here. We understand soil systems, hopefully better than most. We're going out and doing expos more than uh, more than the competition. Uh, and I'm going out of my way to make sure that I carry myself. I conduct myself in a way that is a, in a like a, a, a not in 
like an OG manner, not in the same aspects, but like in Atlanta, Marco, where you know, like, all right, this gentleman, like when he says something, that's that's what he means. And so when I tell somebody like, hey, bring this up and I'll give you $100 cash, I make sure that I pay him right then and there. There's little things from the old school cannabis aspects that go a long, long way in the reptile game. Uh, some of these people were asking me, uh, which is what I've learned is basically like the, the same thing as a front. Like they'll ask you like, hey, can you give me 30, 60, 90 days? And what they're asking you is to front that for 90 days. So I simply um, hopefully politely tell them, you know, I'm not into fronts legally or I was never into it illegally uh, because I've always been of the mindset. If you don't have money to pay me today, how the hell are you going to have money to pay me tomorrow? Exactly. Even um, something that I was always told, you know, how do you know when to buy a tool when you're in construction or you're building something? Well, you know, when to buy a tool is when you need that tool. Like I don't borrow shit. I try not to, you know, I don't borrow. Like if I, if I need the tool, I don't go to borrow it. Then I got to go get that tool because I need it. Now I have that tool when I, and most likely you're going to use it again. So that's just kind of that old school way of thinking, man. You know, always, always just, you know, some people call it stubborn too, probably, but we're just like, we like to do for ourselves, you know, kind of, and, um, and, and do as much as you can without, you know, having to reach out to folks unless you really need it. Duff Nugs, I agree with you. I think Brian is an OG already on this topic, Matt. Oh, yeah. I appreciate that. And I, I like it, Marco, that I'm, I'm earning the gray just like you are, buddy. You know? I see you got some grays coming in down there. I was just looking at Proud that. Of yeah. 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 I like it, man. So, for this you got a long way to go, oh, yeah. man. <laughs> see, that's called a wisdom beard. You know? yeah. We're not there yet. Not for quite. Sure. Uh, so, so again, for you guys, if you understand how to build soil systems or even if you're doing um, like composting worms, that's another thing that I think is could be a potential niche for a lot of you guys out there. Uncle Jim is out there. Everybody knows about him. Uh, a lot of individuals buy from him. Uh, how do I say? It? But most of us know the quality of, of the stuff that's coming from there compared to like Jet House Gardens or other individuals that are doing that. Uh, so there's another opportunity there. You see individuals that are going out of their way uh, to create such diverse vermicompost uh, that myself included, that I, I purchased some from them. You know, I mean, there's just you want that diversity. There's people out there that obviously can make their own cake, still wanting to buy other people's cakes uh, because yeah. it's that good. And that's the way this community should be. You know, there's enough money out there. I personally believe for, for everybody that's willing to go out there and get it. Um, and a lot of people think that you just sit in your house and wish for things and it comes true. Um, and that's not at all what even those books, you know, some of those books, the Think and Grow Riches and The Secret and all that, they're all saying the same thing. It's that that vibration, I think, is really what you're trying to achieve. And you're going to achieve that by going out and doing things and, and, and uh, going to the expos and kind of that stuff. And then it's amazing who you run into, Marco, where it's mm. like, oh, man, I had no idea, idea this person existed. Um, and now, you know, this individual wants to talk to me about doing stuff. And then you find out that that person's a huge player in the game. It's like, well, how did that, you know, how did that link up like that? And that's the weird part, the the woo woo and all that, that um, I used to dismiss wholeheartedly, especially when I lived in Georgia all those years ago. I used to think all that metaphysical stuff was complete bullshit. I even had a girlfriend that was so into it. Her parents were into it. Uh, they made a lamp spin one time in a in a house. I don't know if that was fuckery or if it was real, but I mean, they they made the lamp spin in front of me. Um, so there was a lot. They also showed me pictures the first time I've ever seen where uh, this uh, her grandmother had these white, like super bright white stuff coming out of her head. Every time you took a picture of her, it was wild. Oh, OK, OK. She had that energy. She had that vibe. Yeah, but Amen. I was, yeah, I just never really thought that was real. And then moving out to Colorado and maybe seeing that more people embrace that kind of stuff out here than in the South. Uh, then I started to see things for myself and a few things that uh, kind of scared me, to be honest, you know. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you can uh, poke the bear uh, in the metaphysical world. Uh, we talked about that on uh, last last show, Marco, about some more of the like. Uh, occult kind of stuff and uh, people are really responsive to that so i'm glad for that as well i i want people to understand cannabis and soil and all that but let's also kind of discuss like where you know where we came from and some of that wisdom that's there because uh, i think that would also help us in our personal lives be better people 
which relates to being a better farmer, being a better entrepreneur, being a better family man, husband, wife, whatever it is, uh, because that's the vibration that's going to bring you the money that you're, you're fucking after. And I, I, I know everybody thinks about that shit all day long on a loop. Like, it's tough. Um, so we got to go out of our way to find ways to raise that vibration. Um, you know, when somebody, when I was telling somebody I was dirt poor in uh, Savannah, uh, I was telling him I was in debt and all this shit. The guy started telling me, well, give away everything you have. And that sounded like complete bullshit to me again, man. I got nothing. You want me to give it away? And here you have, you know, this is probably your third home. You're sitting over here drinking uh, Woodford Reserve at $30 a glass because nobody, uh, nobody bad an eye at that place, man. You know, that's the kind of wealth that these individuals have. But most of them were unhappy. And that is something that I was really happy to see is that uh, it seemed like the entrepreneur aspects, those people, uh, you know, they had their family life. They had their business. They seemed like they just really were a little bit different than the ones that were handed their money. Those individuals seemed like life was never good enough. The newest bag didn't suffice. You know, you had, they had to go out and get the newest car. The, you know, I remember that's when the G-Wagon came out. Everybody in that neighborhood had to get that. But it was really hard for, you know, that many people to get the G-Wagon. They were pretty scarce. So it was little things like that that I noticed. Like if they weren't able to get that, then the whole week was ruined, you know. <laughs> right. So I, I'm I'm gracious that uh, I grew up the way that I did, man. That we grew up. I don't know about you, Marco, but I would say I grew up uh, pretty poor, um, and that taught yeah, me we, a lot. Yeah, man. We um, you know, my dad's from a small town in Georgia, Lakeland, Georgia. So it's like poor, poor. It's poor. So um, yeah, but my dad made a decision, young man. He went on to the army. You know what I mean, and he, and he and he got on out of there and, and made a you know made what he thought was a good move to better his life. You know what I mean? There's nothing in those little some of those little towns. There's no industry. There's no where to work other than little grocery stores or family. You know, there's nothing there. You know, so he had to make that decision and leave there. And I tell young people all that all the time, man. Like anybody, like leave, like go, go follow a dream, go do something. And even if you leave for two, three years and come back, you'll see didn't much change when you came back. You didn't miss shit. You know what I mean? So I've always been like that. We, my wife, thankfully, not thankfully, but we've never had kids. So thankfully my wife has always been able to travel with me to go where any kind of business venture, anything I wanted to do. Um, we would always take a risk, you know, and not everybody can do that. But when you're young, you know, take those risks, give it a shot. You know what I mean? The shit back home is going to be there when you get back. You know, you're not missing anything. Um, so yeah, man, I, I, you, you're dropping some good knowledge, man. And I'm glad you realize that like karma, you know, and, and some people never realize it. You know what I mean? Karma is a real thing. Treating people nice is a real thing. And also, man, doing things, whatever, whatever you do in the darkness will come to light. So, you know, if you in the light, you try to be this nice guy and doing all that, but you're really an asshole deep down, like all those things are going to eventually come out. So you have to really work on inside and, you're, you know, being a good person, like, you know, having positive thoughts, like when always thinking to the positive first, you know, wake up positive. You know, some people wake up on some shitty stuff. Like don't wake up shitty, wake up positive, wake up thinking, damn, wow, woke up nice. This is beautiful. Sun's about to rise, you know, take all that stuff in a little bit by a little bit. And somebody, I just saw something the other day, like, don't say, oh, I got to get up and go to work. I got to go do this. I got say you get to do that. I, I'm blessed. My legs work. My arms work. I get to go make money for my family today. May not be the job or the thing I want to do, but you got all day to work your mind. If you're in a mindless job, then your mind all day should be thinking about, all right, how am I going to get out of that? What's, what's my next move going to be? I'm getting this money from them now. I'm going to save up. What's my next move? Always thinking the next move. You know, if you're stuck thinking, if you're in a mindless job and you're only sitting there thinking about that job, then you're never going to, you're never going to get out of it. You know what I mean? You have to, in your mind, you have to blow that shit up. You have to see yourself stand on top of the hill, being a big dog in your industry or whatever you envision yourself doing. You got to Vision, visualize that shit. And, and eventually, I'm telling you, you keep pushing, being active. Like you said, Brian, going out, actively seeking groups of people that are similar and like minded to you. That's when you're going to make those connections. And, you know, that's where that's where the magic happens. When two people meet 
and there's a connection and oh shit you do that oh man i'll do that too boom you know then that's when things spark you know so that's just how i try to live man and i'm an asshole by nature deep down inside as a young man you know i grew up tough you know what i mean like i don't take no shit but i consciously try to be nice you know try to let when people hit my dms try to be nice try to be patient work on it i'm not always perfect but I think if you're actively trying to do the right things, you know, eventually you're going to keep doing the right things a little more, a little more. And life just kind of catches up with you. And and that whole life just moves in that wave of, of a good direction for you, you know, so just ran a little bit. But that's kind of how I look at it, man. I, and that's kind of, you know, advice I would give give folks, you know, coming up. I have to agree with you 100 percent, Marco. It's all in what you do because you're the one making the decisions. Nobody else's opinion really matters for what you do with your life. And that's what you have to understand. You look at dogs. He grew up poor as well. He's now buying his own home at, at what 24 years old. But he stepped up and he went, I'm going to change my life. I'm going to change me. And that's the most important part. Don't worry about anybody else. Make it your mission to be a better human. Well said. And when you're that young and you're able to purchase a home and you're thinking about investing and stuff, I, I've heard this from many individuals. So dogs, so, you know, take this. If What they've always said is you should focus on paying off your house. That is the quickest way for you to become a millionaire is to purchase a house in your early 20s, work your ass off to pay that down. And then once that is paid off, now you don't have that anymore, yet you have equity going up. At most people your age, myself included, I bought the fancy Lexus car. So I spent a lot of money. And then as the years went on, that shit depreciated like crazy. So I invested money into something uh, that lost value. So you're on a whole nother level, man, when you turn 30 years old. Uh, so shout out to you, brother, for uh, finding a way to do that. That's the kind of stuff that I, I would love to see from the community. It's like we all made fucked up choices. We've made mistakes. Uh, some of us got caught uh, and have been, you know, behind the scenes for a lot of bullshit. Uh, so they won't they, they know, you know, I've been to jail several times, luckily never been to prison. Um, and sometimes jail could be worse, man. You know, especially if they know you're only in there for a little bit. So when Marco was talking about, you kind of have to like carry yourself a certain way. I think that's more of a Southern thing. Uh, where people just try you and test you just walking down the street. You'd be just walking down the street wanting to get a little ice cream for yourself, something just completely nonchalant, and some bullshit could go down. So that's why a lot of individuals carry themselves ready to go all the time, and that is exhausting uh, when you have to live your life like that. When you go outside and you're afraid, and most people won't admit that, but when you walk out into certain aspects, even in Atlanta, uh, I was a, you're afraid. You're afraid when you're walking down that street. You don't have enough money for a car uh, or you're the homies, you know, not able to get you. So sometimes you got to walk um, and walking down um, certain streets in Atlanta is uh, fucking scary, man. So to get past all that, man, and be 24 years old and to have a house, that's what I'm talking about, brother. Fuck the streets. Find ways to, to buy your own house. Pay that shit down and you will be well on your way to being self-sufficient. Boom. Hey, great, great advice there. That's the, um, you know, because that's how this, that's how our shit's set up over here. Like property and the houses and all that. That's kind of, that's kind of the door to go to taking that next step. You know, properties. You know, it's tough to just obviously buying a, every new car you see ain't gonna be the way to do it. And you know, people realize that everybody's done that. But you know, like the way it's really set up is it separates you, and that's why it's kind of it's difficult to buy a house. Like they run you through the fucking paperwork. You gotta do, go through all this shit and all these taxes. And, I mean, all the reports, all the old tax filings, and X Y Z. And then you finally can get a house, and that's a great you know feeling. But you know, that's the key because that's the one thing. You know, they're not making any more land. You know, number one, and the housing and land it does nothing but goes up you know it goes up in value so one thing that, that um i was always able to do is we traveled all around the country but i always you know still to this day where i'm sitting right now i kept my first house like i, I always was able to keep it whether if i was living in indy or wherever i was i'd have somebody house sitting it or something because i always knew that it was it was critical to always keep that um that first house and luckily for me i was able to get that when i was still in my 20s 
um, and, you know, 48 now. But like you said, man, like my dad grew up super poor, um, went to the military, met my mom in Germany, you know, had me. I was an only child for seven years. And back then, man, the military didn't pay shit. Like I remember like my dad was in the military. We were living in a trailer in Georgia. Um, my mom will tell stories, you know, like for Christmas, I got one teddy bear, one stuffed animal, shit like that. And I was very, but we were very happy. You know what I mean? It wasn't like we weren't sitting around moping and because we were always worked. My parents always worked. Like me, I don't like, I don't, I, my mindset's a little different. You know, I grind, I bust my ass, I'm, I, I kick ass, but I don't like to do like, call it, well, I got two jobs. Like, you know, I, I look at it as streams of income. You know what I mean? Like I have various different streams of income. I don't like to use the word, you know, boss. I don't have no boss over me. You know what I mean? I use words, you know, like income and things like that instead of job. You know what I mean? But that's just, you know, me and my mindset coming up a little bit different. And it really came from my parents. I saw them working two jobs. And I'm like, as a kid, like, damn, that sucks. You know, you work one job, then you got to go to another job, you know? So those kind of things stuck in my mind. And I've always had the mentality. I'm like, I'm going to try to, you know, get as much income from different streams as I can, you know? And, and believe it or not, even like if you have a, a quote unquote job or your main gig and Pick up something like this on the side. Do that parallel. You know what I mean? Do both for a while, you know, until you can pick up steam with your, you know, natural farming or isopod or soil or whatever you end up getting into. But you got to stick, you know, got to keep that income. And then when you get a chance to, that's when you know when it's time to jump. When when you can no longer work the regular nine to five gig because your side incomes are demanding more of your time and they're bringing in more. That's that's a good way to know. All right, time to leave that behind. Let's take that next step. You know, it's mindset. If you're working a corporate job, a nine to five, um, and at that location, people rely on you. They come to you. They ask you questions. Um, you know, you, you feel like you uh, kind of are more of like a leader of that aspect. I promise you that skill set is going to allow you to be a successful entrepreneur because you're going to get up and actually hold yourself accountable. Make sure that you get your work done. Uh, because when you are an entrepreneur, like Marco was saying, the beauty is there is no boss. But for some people, that means that ah, I'll do it tomorrow or I'll do it next week. Correct. And uh, if you live your life like that, then being an entrepreneur obviously isn't for you. And it's not for everybody. But that's what I meant when you work at like a corporate place. You kind of wonder like, well, how come they didn't see this or why aren't they doing these things? If, you, if your mindset is that and you're frustrated at your job, start start building the road to uh, becoming an entrepreneur. Um, and even just being an entrepreneur alone, uh, you might have to uh, wait for that little niche thing to pop up. So in that time, get that skill set, learn how to make the easiest thing, I think, for passive income, honestly, is to get a Shopify website. Find something that you can sell. Yeah. Understand how to how to write a few articles um, right on your phone. That's all you need. That is <laughs> got to be one of the easiest ways to build passive income. Um, and so you have to have some skill set, I promise. And. Uh, Shopify makes it pretty easy again after a, a video course or two um, to set it up to where you're now making a, a pretty good living for yourself. Uh, and then if you're doing that on top of uh, your normal job, like Marco was saying, eventually um, that might take months, that might take years. It really depends on what there's too many variables for that. Uh, but to know that things are improving week by week, month by month, the same way with our soil system, the same thing with your finances and, and just your overall joy for life is improved week by week, month by month. And then when you start to really not have debt anymore and you don't, I hope my wife doesn't mind me sharing this, but we just paid 13 months uh, of rent to our, our landlord. So I don't have to worry about that for a year and one month. Um, and that is from rubber duckies. So I want you guys to kind of understand that now to give me that, to know that I got this runway where I can go all over and start hustling these things left and right with my wife. Uh, I know that in the back of my mind, I don't have those things that I have to cover or I don't have to go out there and take ma major risks to be able to also do the things that we're doing. Um, that is the, the whole thing that I want to give to you guys, the community. I want you guys to find your own way so that you have enough uh, disposable income or income that you want to you know, move certain ways to where the life itself is a little bit better. And I think doing things like that is what allows that vibration to go up. And if you believe that karma is what brings money, 
Uh, that's what I learned at like 37 years old. It's not money. It's not the, the secret. You're not sitting over there wishing for the money to come. All that stuff is more just about who you are as a person, what you're going out and doing on a daily basis um, and hustling. I mean, there's no there is no shortcut to success. I mean, even the people that, that talk about that uh, on the back end, that they did it overnight. A lot of those people are usually lying. Uh, they actually were working behind the scenes. And uh, it's, it's really rare uh, for people to succeed even when they start things up within like, a you know, it takes a couple of years. Most people say like three years. Uh, a lot of individuals quit after like 90 days. So you're giving yourself three months to do this business. You know, you've been doing life this whole time uh, and you give yourself just a few months to be successful. That that can't be the move. And these are why all, all this stuff has to be chess moves. All this stuff has to be proactive. Um, if you don't have the money, then, of course, start cutting things out. Listen to that Dave Ramsey snowball thing. That's what I did. That's how I was able to just do what I had mentioned with the house payments. You know, it's not even that we have more money. It's just you're moving your money and making things change for you. So now that you have this business that you can put full effort and time into without any debt, uh, allows you to have laser focus and you can do that on a microcosm scale and then build up. And that's definitely what I was doing when you're just paying off some credit cards or whatever that is, paying that stuff down, man, you get a little money each month. And I believe uh, his famous quote is live like no one else so that you can live like no one else. Uh, what he's saying there is that you're going to stop doing everything. That's what basically I did in 2020. Uh, we, you know, kind of forced not to spend money uh, and start paying things down and listening to podcasts and listening to other individuals talk about wealth. Uh, and then I started to see that um, most individuals that are self-made, uh, it, it takes, you know, till they're probably like 55, between 55 and 65, it seems like where that's really done uh, well uh, for somebody that didn't hit the lottery with their business kind of thing, like a Bill Gates or Elon Musk or something that just went crazy with it. Most individuals that are self uh, made, they actually start to see that success. Uh, some of them, you know, like in their forties, but most, like I said, between like the fifties and the 60 to 65, and that's that sweet spot. So if you are older, you are, you know, in your later thirties and you think life has passed you by, um, I, I encourage you to listen to people that have real wealth and knowledge uh, because they're saying the exact opposite. They're saying that they actually put their shit together when they were older in life. Um, so, again, there's, you know, there's a lot to learn there. And I think listening to a variety of different podcasts on just health and wealth will allow you to become a, a better and more efficient entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You got to set those goals, too, you know write them down, you know, where do you want to be in five years, 10 years or whatever? You know, it's crazy, man. Like, I'm, you know, I'm not old, old, I'm just 48, but you know, as you get older, man, you, you still, you look back, you're like, damn, I remember when I just bought this house, you know, now it's 20 some years later, like life just keeps on going, you know, it just keeps on going. And you look, you look and like, you go through hard times. I went through hard times, went through good times, but then you eventually look and you start saying, well, damn, it's all just good times now. You know, things are going fine. Obviously, you got to deal with life incidents, you know, lose people, things happen. I'm, I'm, I get that. But financially and, and on that level, man, it, it, and business wise, when you start seeing things that you hoped you would see in 20 years, you know, it, it's pretty cool, man. It's, it's almost like, you know, I got trees I planted when they were just a, a bare root, you know, and now they're huge, you know, good sized trees. You know, it's like. Eventually, you're like, wow, I got pecans. You know, I planted a pecan tree when it was just like this. And now, you know, I'm actually eating pecans. And, and it just kind of gradually happens, you know. So that's why I, my advice to folks is just when I stick with something. And that's what I did. When, when you get in an industry and you like that industry, stick into it. Stick with it. Keep grinding. Keep working your way up. And don't feel stagnant because if you got someone that you report to or someone that's above you, you can always make that your next goal you know that's your next goal to move up i want that guy's position or i want to be doing what he's doing or maybe i'll get goes to another company and then do that guy's position another thing i've always done when you if you ever switch companies or if you ever change you know the company you work for take a step up you know that's your opportunity to step up don't just step laterally and try to do the exact same thing when you move that new company 
you know, you know what you're doing if you've been in that industry long enough. Now try to step up, apply for that next higher up position. And, you know, and, and eventually you'll just keep working your way up into an industry and then you'll get to a, a place that you get, you know, really comfortable. Um, keys, though, doing stuff you like to do. You know, it's tough to have a, a good life if you're not doing something you like to do. You know, if you really hate what you're doing, that sucks. Um, so just focus on, you know, things you like. And another good bit of advice somebody gave me that had a lot of money. They said, do good and then you will do well. Like focus on doing good. Like if you're selling isopods, only focus on the quality of that. Only focus on giving that good customer service. Only focus on that. The money's going to come. <laughs> you know, you don't have to look for the money when you do that. So that's kind of my point, you know, um, quality, doing it right, integrity, and then you know, everything else will come. But so we've been preaching a lot on the financials, which is cool. You know, we like to talk about life and stuff. But I know you do also have some isopods to share with us, Brian. Did you um want to get back to that? And one, my, my buddy, um, shout out to Aaron Leviathan Seeds. Um, first question, is there an isopod that's just better for an indoor living cannabis system than another? And I'm sorry you already had a question, Kim, but I was on my thought. Um, so if you're wanting to do with an indoor, um, you want to focus on something that's a little more protein uh, based. Uh, the basic grays that everybody uses, you know, those are known to eat live plants. Um, and that's just kind of how that species is. That doesn't mean that all isopods do that. Uh, for the most part, isopods don't want to eat anything living. Uh, they're decomposers. They're breaking down dead things. They want to eat dead, decaying wood. Um, so, again, it's going to come down more to your personal choice, I guess, with some of that stuff. There's so many isopods um, that I, I can like kind of guide you as there's these things called Oreo crumbles. Uh, they are fantastic that work with uh, the springtails. Uh, they do multiply uh, decently quick so that things can continue, especially if you're using like a raised bed indoors. Uh, but they also won't uh, eat your um, plants. Um, there are dairy cows that some people use. The uh, caveat with that is that these can get out of control, uh, just like uh, the grays, and do have the potential uh, to eat everything because that's kind of just how they are. They will also the dairy cows will eat each other if there's not enough food. Again, these are extremes. If you're on top of things, if you have enough wood and leaves and stuff, and you're checking on them at least every few days, three days, uh, I like to check on them every day, every other day. Uh, but again, that's my this is my business. Uh, so if you're just doing this as like a reptile thing, then, yeah, just every few days, maybe a little spray on some uh, sphagnum water, uh, spag sphagnum fiber in the corner. Spray that with a little bit of water. Um, and then they, that's known as the hydration station. And as long as the hydration station is built within your isopod world and you have living microbes, then you can kind of play around with a variety of isopods. Um, I would say just kind of stay away from the ones outdoors uh, because those are the ones that are notorious uh, for eating your plants. So you want to buy isopods from someone like myself that is doing what's known as captive breeding, meaning we're buying them um, from someone else that's captive breeding them, breeding them ourselves. I would like to say hopefully improving the colony with uh, food sources and chitin and different sources of calcium. And then once they get even healthier, then that becomes a fantastic food source uh, for the reptile world or is also a fantastic uh, decomposer for your beds and for especially for your worm bins. So if you've never done that, I would say uh, choose a species you think looks cool um, and then put it in your worm bin so that's not actually in your cannabis plants. Uh, make sure that nothing is going funky in there. Make sure you stay on top of things. And then I think you'll have the confidence to start using a variety of different isopods uh, within your living soil substrates. Uh, great answer. Jared Kushner, buddy, uh, Jared, uh, any limitations on pot size? He has 15 gallons. Is that too small? I know that's a little small. We like a little, about 20 for living soil at the minimum, but what do you think on getting some isopods in there? Yeah, I, I would say I like I like 25 gallon, 30 gallon. I mean, especially if you don't have to move them too much and you can just slide them. Uh, again, remember the, the the bigger the roots, the the bigger the fruits, the bigger the stomach you know, the overall health of the, that system seems to improve, uh, especially if you're thinking long term, Jared. And I, I see you all over Instagram, buddy. I know that you watch this show religiously. 
Uh, so I would say to you, sir, thinking long term, thinking bioactive, I would invest in some quality mm -hmm. fabric pots build up to a 15 or I'm sorry, a 25 to 30 gallon move away from the 15 gallon. Um, and you're going to see a lot more uh, just overall health and probably a little bit better success uh, with the plant just being able to stretch your legs a little bit easier. Exactly. What up? OK, Calix. Um, Yeah, definitely, man. Like, the trust me, the bigger the soil, the easier, the more ease on the farmer, man, the more you can leave, go out of town, forget things, you know, things kind of balance themselves out. The soil buffers the input you put in a lot more. You know, it's more forgiving. You know, I can pretty much put anything into a big living soil and, you know, the soil will kind of take care of it for the most part because I have so much diversity. That's my career. Yeah, Jared, you just did a um nice um I saw you did a nice Hugo outdoor too. So yeah, Jared's on top of it. But yeah, like he said, I we go twenty, probably twenty five on up with the pot size. And uh for, for individuals that are newer to fabric pots, that's where you want to spend your money. Uh you don't want to go cheap on that, and then a year from now you're sliding a fabric pot across the basement floor and it rips a hole in the middle. Uh because then you basically got to start all over with you're going to have to move all that soil. It's, you're going to disturb it. Uh, so that extra five bucks or whatever it is per bag is well worth it when it's triple stitched or, you know, what, however they're marketing it. Just double check. In my opinion, make sure it was made from Amer in America and then it's triple stitched and that will be quality. And who would you recommend, Brian? Uh, well, there's a variety of people. Uh, green, uh, the, the fabric pot. What, what are they called? I always get the hat company and their company mixed up. Uh, are we talking grassroots? Grassroots fabric pots. There we go. Yeah, okay. uh, I know that I've used them. Uh, I've reached out to uh, Tyler in the past, and he's a fantastic individual. Uh, so those are something that you guys can uh, check out. Um, and, again, that's where money is well spent, uh, putting it into a company like that that is, uh, you know, they're made here in America. Uh, it's just a night and day difference. Maybe not when you first get them. You might not even notice it. But as, as time progresses, as you're moving them around, as you're just being a business, uh, you're going to notice if you go the cheap route that everything starts to rip. The handles will rip. Um, this is going to happen, I promise you. Oh, yeah, especially the little cheapos with the handles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you're buying the cheapest fabric pot in the hydro store, you're going to regret that, I promise you. You're going to remember Marco and I saying this. And exactly. you're like, ah, oh, shit. What did I really save myself? Because, I mean, when you're a basement farmer, how many of those pots are you really buying, man? You yeah. know, you got 10 of them, so maybe it was an extra 50 bucks, right? That's, right. That's money well spent. Quality. We always talk, you know, I like to buy things quality because I want to buy them once, you know. There's some other fabric pots out there, like some, and chat can help me out. There's some, like, there's a little man or something on one. Like, it's like it looks like an old Grow man. Pro. The I've Grow Pros. Okay. That. I've never I tried though. Yeah, I haven't used that one either. Okay. But, but I do see people using them. So, you know, you th there is a difference uh, when it comes to that kind of stuff. So that's just another little, uh, hopefully, saves you guys time later down the, run the road uh, when you don't have to replace that stuff. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, because I have, I mean, I spent you know, on Smart Pot like so many years ago, and that thing is so old, so much bag crud all on the outside that hasn't ripped once. Like it's the isopods are actually, I need to take a picture that I got it wrapped in plastic, and then on the bottom, you know, a little tag that says Smart Pot, so ratted up, and the isopods are just on that thing to like chew on the tag, and it's still just hanging in there. But um, yeah, spending money on good quality, you know, is the key, I think um on and everything lighting definitely lighting like i don't mess around with the lighting um get some quality but there's a lot of lights that can grow quality you know so you know i'm not gonna drop brands but spend good money do your research you know everything you do is quality like what good is it if you go buy isopods from somewhere and then you get them there all dead like i mean that's just a waste of everybody's time so you know reach out to somebody that's shipping things right you know, even buying things like clones, anything like that, are they testing them, you know, for the virus or they doing, you know, all that stuff matters. All that stuff is part of, you know, quality that will help you, because if you're dealing with people that aren't quality, it's going to be hard for your 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 grow and your setup to be, you know, to be very quality. Um, 
So yeah, just some some points on that. But I have a lot of like this isopod you see on my screen behind me. This is a native local one around me. It's not an ugly gray. Um, so there are some, you know, you can get some some diversity out there. Um, the problem I have when I build my soils is I do get a little bit of everything in there. But when they overpopulate, I just drop a piece of watermelon in there or, or avocado, brings them all up to the surface. You just scoop them off, toss them outside or into another bed. You know what I mean? Um, they they It's never really too bad of a thing. And and I noticed that if I let my soil dry out for long periods, that will diminish my isopod population as well. So if you guys are having a real bad problem, then I would suggest kind of pulling your mulch off at the end of a run, letting that soil really get really dry because they're 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 from the ocean, like their roots are from the ocean. So they have to be moist. So if you let that soil kind of dry out a little bit, you'll knock a good percentage of those isopods down if that's what you need to do. And again, uh, if you have a problem, uh, a bearded dragon is going to eat a ton of those. You'd be super surprised. Or if you have a couple chickens outdoors, same thing. You'd be surprised how many of the isopods are eaten uh, within just a few hours. Exactly. Oh, um, Operation Annihilation. Um, I got a cicada killer in my garden too, man. He's she's there every day. Like, and so what they are just a big ass wasp okay you can look it up I, you know i talk generic it's a big ass wasp that actually kills cicadas and grasshoppers and large um flying insects like that it'll drill a hole in your garden and if you watch that hole you can if you're patient you can sit there and watch that cicada killer bring back a cicada or a drag um grasshopper and stuff it in that hole close it up and what it's doing is it's putting its egg in there its egg will hatch, feed on that um, cicada or grasshopper, whatever it put in there, and then it'll hatch and kind of repeat the cycle. So cicada killer, huge, looks like a beast, but um, docile, unless you fuck with it. And I like it. I like having them around. They're pretty cool. Okay, so that's a form of a wasp, a cicada killer, because that sounds yeah. exactly what a wasp does. They'll you know, pull the food in for their young and then go do it again and again and again. Yep, same thing, same kind, same concept. They're more of a solitary, so you won't see a big old nest of cicada killers. Thankfully, they're they're so huge. Um, bad man Jager, I started using round cocoa sheets as removable mulch to keep my soil moist between waterings. I've noticed it helping my top soil health. Yeah, no, you're doing great. That's fine. I would just maybe add a little alfalfa. Instead of buying the sheets, you could just go get alfalfa straw too and kind of cut out a little bit of that price. But we like our mulch, man. Hell uh, yeah, we love our living mulch. Exactly. So I don't understand. You guys want to do some more questions? Sure. I've, oh, I've got some questions lined up. So, um, so what is a cicada killer exactly? Is that just the, the name of the wasp? Yeah, it's a wasp. I thought I explained that, but okay, it's a wasp <laughs> that's, that eats cicadas and grasshoppers and burrows in the ground and drags them in there and lays an egg. They're called because of, they kill cicadas. Come on, guys. All right, well, we'll jump into this one. Green mulch versus straw mulch. Pros and cons of each. Oh, green mulch. Okay. Green mulch versus straw mulch. I like straw. Okay. All right. I'll give you my little two cents. I like uh, green mulch is fine. Okay. But I run a high amount of biology. My, my soils are like there's pounds and pounds and pounds of isopods, springtails. There's so much in there. For me, a green mulch I'm not getting that nutrient cycling because I I take a good four inches of alfalfa and that shit shreds down to pretty much zero after a 10 week uh, run. So for me, I'm not getting enough. I can't grow enough green mulch, chop it, and then have enough biomass in the soil to sustain everything I got going in there. So for me, the green mulch isn't um isn't the best methods for me i like to be able to add mulches at the end of the runs and then i add amendments along with those you know like if i'm feeling like the soil might need some gypsum i'll add that in at, with that mulch so that's just my point and some living mulches get 
I don't know. To me, they get a little bit messy. You know, they get a little bit all over the place sometimes. There's guys that do them really well. Um, you know, big dogs, GLP out in Las Vegas, you know, folks like that. They're really doing them wonderful. Um, it's more of your style. For my style, I've done them. I like the um, straw mulches at the end. It just gives me more chance to build up uh, more biomass and more shredding. Uh, and remember, we've talked about this on previous shows. Uh, it seems like more of the upper echelon commercial living soil farmers are toying around with using grasses so that things stay lower and then using the, the brown mulches. So they do have that. It's a quick, easy thing for labor. Uh, and then the brown mulch is obviously uh, a, a stable uh, ingredient. Yeah, definitely. So this uh, uh, Tom says uh, rollies are rare. So I'm believing rolly polies. Uh, I don't know exactly where all the people that say they get them. I don't know if they're really rare or not. I would say the, the basic grays that we talk about, the bologna ones, um, those are not rare. I even uh, collected a few of those and um, was going to like give them away and stuff. And even the kids, when they come to the expos, they like seeing the dairy cows better. So I just give away the dairy cows. So even the kids don't even really find interest in that because they've seen them before. Um, so in my opinion, uh, the, the basic grays that you see are more harm than beneficial. Okay. Marco, you got something to add to that, brother? Um, I think, yeah, I mean, some of those are rare guys because some of them were found like in caves of Thailand, you know what I mean? And now they've taken them and they're captive breeding them like Brian's doing, you know? So, yeah, yeah, some really poor, some of them are very rare. But like he said, in, in most healthy soils, you shouldn't have any problems finding like a, you know, a roly poly anywhere around and that's a that picture of me that's a cicada killer and a cicada being killed and that's why they got their name let's bring that up so we get a better image of it here okay that's nice so are ki cicadas any actually good for the garden at any time or, or is it better to, to have them gone uh, totally um, cicadas, they stay up in the trees. They don't ever mess with any of our garden plants. Um, they're fine. I, I like having those wasps. Any, I like, I like having most wasps around because most wasps are going to be killing grasshoppers. Most of them are going to be grabbing caterpillars. Um, and they don't bother me or sting me unless I was foolish enough to go uh, messing with them. You know, so I, 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 I like having wasps. I like when I see that around, around my garden and everything. So we'll ask this one. Why are grays bad, Brian? Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say bad in the sense of it's an isopod. They're very efficient in what they're doing. It just seems like they're so hungry once the population gets out of control that they're eating everything. So they're eating everything that's decaying and everything that's living. So if you're growing cannabis plants, it's just too much of a... Um, there's too much of a risk, in my opinion, to do that. If you want to see how quickly things develop, throw a few of those, throw like 20 of those in a, um, a worm bin and see how fast they populate. And you'll see why, um, you know, they're not recommended. Yeah, they can get a little bit over overpopulated on you for sure. And see now, say like if you set up that living soil, you know, you say, oh, I watched Marco. So I set up my living soil. Mulch. If you don't maintain that bio, that that food for them that they can shred because remember if you're growing cannabis you're growing plants everything pretty much you're growing you're taking out i mean if you're dropping some leaves sure that's one thing but remember you're taking everything out so you have to mimic if you're doing it natural you have to mimic nature you have to mimic that chop and drop that's the only way you're going to be able to feed your shredders and when you feed your shredders like your isopods then you're feeding your springtails and you're going on down the classification to the smaller, smaller microbes, fungi, bacteria, and it all kind of works together. But if you set up these big net living soils, you got the isopods, everything's rolling. And then you get to a point where you're not thinking about feeding them. They will start chewing your stems. They will chew your stalks. And a lot of times, if you don't keep your soil moist enough, they will go to that stalk too. They'll start chewing it. Um, getting that moisture because i thought i had a plant i didn't really i was kind of neglecting it didn't pay much attention and one day i started looking towards the bottom of it 
and the stalk was really big, you know, like um, kind of like it was wide, like they got really big at the bottom, and I and I couldn't. I was like, damn, okay. And when I looked closer, I could see that the isopods have been chewing the bark off of it, you know, stripping the bark, stripping the bark. So the stem kept getting bigger and bigger. Once I realized that, I said, well, damn, I'm not keeping this bed moist enough. Uh, and then so I also went ahead and took some um, burlap, mixed up some clay real wet, took some burlap strips, soaked them in the clay like you would old cast back in the day. And then I just took that clay and burlap and wrapped it around that stalk to keep them from continuing continuing to chew on that. And then um, I was able to, you know, ha get them off my plants that way. But, um, you know, you got to kind of be creative, man. When those grays, they can get a little aggressive on you. And people have had them all over their plants. If you don't freaking, you know, if you let them get out of control, for sure. Now, Brian, are there are there any isopods that I can bring in that will bully out the grays and say, all right, well, now we're going to start making it where these grays don't have as much room to kind of do their thing? Yeah, let me show you. Okay. So these are the dairy cows. Um, can you guys kind of see? Man. You can see somebody moving around in the bottom. I don't know why the camera's all blue. Uh, let me see if I can. Kill your background, Brian. Maybe that would help. Okay. I think. I think some of the blues are picking up because I, I use that background thing. But can you guys see that one there? Yeah, yeah, yeah that looks good right there. Okay, so these are the tried and true. This is how, if no one's ever used an isopod in the reptile world, this is what I tell them to purchase. Um, basically, this is kind of like the, the, tr the, the bulletproof isopod. This is the dairy cow, Porcelia labus. Um, and this is a protein-hungry isopod. So this isopod would actually prefer to eat each other before hmm. eating your plants. Hmm. The, again, the caveat with that, though, is that they are extremely prolific. So if you're newer to isopods, this might be uh, one you might want to work with later on if you're growing plants. If you're okay. using it to feed your reptiles, this is extremely uh, cost-effective. And if you build yourself a master culture, you would never have to purchase that feeder again, which could potentially save you, you know, hundreds to thousands of dollars, depending on how many reptiles you have at the house. Yeah, I see um, all different ages in there. It looks like some tiny ones in there, too. Right. And that's what we're kind of showing here is that you want. So when our when our customers get this, it's on bioactive soil. That is obviously a sphagnum peat moss there that's considered the, the hydration station. Um, and that's something that I think a lot of people forget about is that there are crustaceans like Marco had mentioned. They're not really just bugs. Like if you're just thinking of them living in the dirt, uh, that's probably uh, short sighted thinking with this kind of stuff. Um, but let me uh, kind of shake them here. So they burrow. Um, and you can see there's a variety of them there. Uh, age wise. And that's exactly what you want to see. This is a strong, healthy colony. That means within a few weeks, uh, you'd probably start to see, you know, another 50 of these. And then, you know, it's 100 to 200, 200 to 400 kind of thing. Yeah, I like that. That's good to know. And those are actually um, so bugs. If you look at the back end when they have those two points like that. Correct. These are because uh, they don't roll up like a roly poly. Correct. So that's why we say isopods, because that's kind of like the umbrella term. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, the origins of this is kind of unknown. Some people think that it came from Europe. Uh, some people believe that they were created right here in America. So uh, that's one of the few isopods where we're not really sure where it came from. That's pretty cool. Um, let me show you the one that started it off for me from a, um, you know, a business standpoint. Oh, that's so weird, dude. I don't know. That's wild looking. <laughs> <laughs> Here, let me set that. Oh, y'all can see me. I mean, All right. so, somebody, if they have epilepsy, we're in trouble, man, because they're having a seizure. <laughs> uh, well, definitely don't want that. Seizures are horrible, horrible things. Switch back to mine right quick, Ken. Oh. Uh, 
Okay, there you go, Marco. There we go. There we go. So this is this is look how big that is. That's in the same family as what he's showing you in that cup. This is from the ocean. Like these creatures came from the ocean, which is why you they they can't dry out. Like if you get to let them get too dry, they'll you know they'll die. But I mean, can you imagine that? That's crazy right there. And I think they get even bigger than that. Yeah, that's okay. pretty fucking big. You consider that person's hand, uh, and that's supposed to be, you know, the small biology, you know, but that's in the ocean, so it's got yeah. the space. Yeah. It's like a goldfish, maybe, because I know my goldfish, when I was using them for my aquaponic system, if you gave them the uh, larger tank, they would grow to fill the tank. The larger the tank was, the larger they would grow. I'm wondering if that's basically the same with isopods. Well, I'm sure there's a limit because of, you know, but it may be true in the ocean, Ken. I bet I, I wouldn't doubt it. The ocean things seem to grow indefinitely out there and fish, you know, are one of them. Let me, uh, let me turn off my virtual background. Those look like what are they, pandas. It, it looks pretty cute, though, the virtual background. We're not sure, uh, you know, if that was Marco, if it was the bug or if it was the bug that was the bug. There we go. All right. Can you see this a little bit better that way? Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Lock it in right there. That's not, we can see. All that. right. So there this bug go. or this isopod is from France. Uh, it's the yellow zebra. So um, the white zebra is what started this whole thing for me. Um, this is kind of a rare one that was just discovered pretty recently as well. Hmm. Um, so again, things are always evolving with this uh, industry. Um, and again, you know, you, once you start to, to get these going here, I mean, you can kind of see that they're pretty prolific for, can, these are considered a designer isopod. Uh, the, the zebra itself with the white, that's considered more of a beginner isopod. This one's a little bit harder to uh, get going. Uh, but again, you know, secret to you guys watching the show, if you're building that soil system, uh, there really is, uh, it's really hard to kind of fail with a lot of these things unless uh, you're not understanding proper ventilation. Um, again, yeah, it's all about biology, understanding the microbial world. And when you get these to start to breed, a lot of these are like $5 a head and up. I see springtail <laughs> over there to the left too. Right there yeah. in the middle of the screen, springtail running around. Using uh, rove beetles in here. There's also uh, composting worms. Um, I'm just using the red wigglers because it's only about two inches deep. Uh, so, again, just understanding what you should use. Yeah, that was a good point Brian just made. Um, you guys know, like, red wigglers are type, you know, type of composting worm. They stay, like, if it was out in the wild, they like to be right up under the leaves, like where the leaves drop and the forest floor meets. That's where you'll see your wigglers. Other other worms will go deeper, you know, night crow. Oh, yeah, nice springs in there. Oh, yeah, that's life. I love to see that, that, that life in there. That's what it's all about. And to again yeah. to the community, most people in the reptile world don't know this. So you are already a step ahead of this stuff. Make that soil system. I made that. I know that most of you know how to make this kind of stuff. Uh, and if you want to even just go the springtail route, because buying these things is is pretty expensive, Marco. Like some well, of them, you're dropping like like thousands of dollars and hoping that two of them mate. Uh, so and look, that's castings underneath that that wood you turned up. All that black oh, stuff yeah, on there, man. that's all castings from the isopods. Freshly made. Yeah, that's nice, man. Yeah, so these are from France. So again, you know, it's something uh, pretty unique. Uh, you could put these in your um, like worm bins, uh, but I wouldn't necessarily put these in, um, you know, growing your cannabis until you are very familiar with isopods. Uh, because this species alone has sometimes a tendency uh, to eat plants. So, again, you really yeah. need to understand what species you're using. Um, and then there's a variety of uh, morphs from that species that then you can kind of play around with as almost like a, you know, you can pick your favorite color and all that kind of stuff. But, um, yeah, this is an endless road, man. And a lot of people think of it more of like Pokemon where everybody wants to start collecting them all. Yeah, definitely. That that's that diversity. It's no different than the guy. You know, everybody wants to collect cuts. We collect. You know, every, we collect everything. We like that diversity. Um, and I, uh, these are uh, pistachio shells. Uh, this is another thing that I found. Um, usually, when I, they're flipped over, uh, but you can see that they're really starting to uh, break down. 
Uh, but the the isopods seem to like to hide underneath it. And then, um, in my opinion, they must be uh, uh, enjoying each other's company because, you know, a month goes by and all of a sudden you see a lot of little babies around that. So I've been putting pistachio shells everywhere. Um, that could be totally placebo. Uh, but it, in my opinion, it seems like it allows them to have a little more um, shelter to do what they do. Yeah, like a little a turtle in a shell, man. That's their protection. That's right. And they and they somehow I don't know. It seems like they prefer it over that bark that you see as well. So just again, adding that diversity, adding things that are going to break down the pistachio shell. Obviously, takes a while to break down, but does break down a lot quicker than that bark that you see uh, right next to it. So uh, having the variety of things breaking down, newer Boom. things as well as older things. That's how you're really getting the next level soil systems. Gold bar right there. That we're hey look diversity on everything, even diversity of the stuff that your shredders are shredding. You're like all of that. You can't. What if he had only pistachio shells? You wouldn't have the diversity. Can't just have only that. You gotta have that and that and that. You know. That's where you get that diversity. And that looks. It looks like somebody's getting busy right there, Brian. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they um, they, they like to fornicate, man. So it is kind of like red wigglers and other See, I'm things. Can a fourth one getting in there? Yeah, look at him, probably getting jealous. I've seen them fight. Uh, I've seen the dairy cows fight over pieces of um, of protein, mostly uh, the freeze dried peas. So mm -hmm. yeah, they're um, uh, this is why I love that phrase like worlds upon worlds. You could just sit here. I've uh, enjoyed you know taking a, some mushrooms and just sitting here watching them for hours. You know, changing the boxes because I have a, I have a few boxes to show our, our viewers today. Uh, but again, you know, it's all about this. Uh, I do have a little bit of biochar, but you notice it's not not that much. It's mostly just decaying things. Yeah. Uh, and I'll switch boxes here if you want to switch cameras, Cam. Yeah, we can uh, switch sure. it up. Um, Lucas Nan had a question. Uh, was way back. Blah blah blah. Uh, kombucha first ferment after it's done. Breathable lid um kombucha you better let a little bit of gas off on that yeah i, I use a i use a tight lid um uh, but you gotta gas it and then well, it will explode a bottle if you don't have it vented properly yeah you know? if, you, if you don't gas it then keep your cap loose i mean yeah definitely yeah yeah and then and i um, did have it lucas i had it in the background stored man i i did actually oh. have <laughs> you coming up okay and then he says seawater yeah, I just I just put my seawater in a, a container with a, t a tight lid because I don't want to lose it to evaporation. Okay, looks like Brian's ready to go on a new one here. Well, he's got the cork up. All right, and then you'll see this uh, obviously is oyster shell, uh, and that's from my boy Marco there uh, using uh, another thing. So I was using the pistachios in one bin, uh, started using the oyster shells in another. And again, I've noticed, especially if I go out of my way, kind of, you know, improving on Mother Nature. So I'm sprinkling the uh, food uh, mm -hmm. underneath that oyster shell. Uh, you start to see a lot more um, reproduction going on. And there's something about the oyster shell flower that really allows the springtails to take hold. They yeah, also they really uh, like love that, man. Yeah, they really love, uh, seems like they really love working in conjunction with the red wiggler. So they come to the top, obviously, when you put them up. Uh, another thing that uh, the community can use if you're trying to get rid of them is most isopods. I would say like, I don't know the exact number, but 80%, maybe 70% uh, will all come to this, which is known as cork bark. Uh, so if you put that around in that area, it is going to probably take a few days, uh, but they will start to take hold um, and they will kind of start to... Uh, build up a, a little family here because that's what's going on um and then the obvious obviously the safer they feel the more numbers that are around uh the actual um health of the colony seems to take off and that's when you'll see a lot of the colors kind of come in the size of them uh clowns aren't normally this big um and again this is in my opinion because we're using the soil food web uh so this is what kind of distinguishes me right now in the isopod world as because this stuff is a little bit bigger uh, than other people are used to seeing, and it's all credit to the soil food web. So, you so got these are called fatties. clowns, kluge clowns. Um, these are highly sought after uh, bioactive cleanup crew. 
um, you know, will become healthy. But I would say this colony probably took me almost a year to build up. Uh, so you guys can see that they're going to be breaking things down without ever um, coming close to uh, eating your plants. So this is another cool little isopod. Uh, this isopod is from Croatia. How many members do you think you started with this community here? Uh, usually I, well, when I first got into this man, I was buying six and I learned okay. real quick, just like with, uh, cannabis breeding and stuff that I could have bought six males. Right. I could just sit there and have, you know, three months of spinning my wheels. So that's when I started to try to buy at least 50. Uh, if you look at the price points per head, sometimes you can see why I'm saying this is a, uh, a chess move. You want to make sure that you understand how to take care of these before you start putting up that kind of money, because it does seem like it, that kind of money is needed to start most of these colonies uh, where you then yourself are being able to breed enough uh, to handle all of your customers, because these are pretty rare um, outside of the isopod community. So when people see them, they usually snatch them up. Okay. And Dank saying, I want to farm isopods. I know, Great right? Stuff. <laughs> so hey, cool. man. You got the plug right here. If you want them, farm them. Start with Brian. Mm -hmm. Shit. Okay. Hey. And there's the website that you can go and order from Rubber Ducky Isopods. And then you know you're getting the good stuff with the good soil. It's bioactive. <laughs> All right, uh, I got another one here, uh, the Gestroy. These are from Italy. It'll take me a second, though, to switch them up. For me, so, man, yeah. it's all about that, you know, diversity of poop, you know? It's all about the poop, you know? You got a lot of different biology. You got a lot of different isopods, different springs, and you and it's ultimately for the plant, right? I mean, that's, the, that's why I'm doing I'm the, well, I do what I do. It's crazy how plants just got us by the balls. Look at all the stuff plants make humans do. They make millions of people grow them in their basement, in their closet, in their attic, sneaking, violating laws. Doing plants are making you do that. Isn't that an that's amazing if you really think about it? That relationship we have with you know plants. Oh yeah, and it it we can't stop because it's just it's how we are and who we are. We have to be creator beings and grow because that's how we grow inside as well. And uh, like Brian is is on an adventure of isopods, and it's absolutely brilliant that he can bring it, show it, and this is another way for our community to get through these rough times is to look for these different things that you can do to sell and make money to survive. Yes, be unique. Find that unique thing that you like. What are these, Brian? Uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah, what yep. are these? All right, so these are Gestroy. They're from Italy. And uh, to the like 11 o'clock there of that isopod, that is a molt, meaning that mm -hmm. the isopod just grew larger. Uh, when you're in the isopod game, uh, that's second best. You want to see babies coming from these. And then if, if you haven't seen that yet, then you want to see them molting, meaning they're progressing, meaning that you have a healthy soil system. And once that healthy soil system, like I said, is there, it seems like the isopods kind of know what to do. If the diversity of the soil is there, they will just kind of hang out, move around, do what they need to do, break down those peas. Freeze dried is important. Uh, if it's not freeze dried, there's not enough nutritional value there. Um, that's mm. another reason why I don't recommend using um, the fish flakes like you see a lot of people online talking about. There's a lot of fillers, a lot of colors and stuff in that fish uh, flake. Uh, that is, again, fish food. And I don't necessarily think that it's uh, a good thing to build your colonies. I've personally had colonies crash uh, using fish food. Mm. Gold bar right there. Good to know. So and that's why I put up KZ. Is it like pretty much like anything, Brian? I mean, it's you can't cut corners, right? I mean, this is nature. There's no shortcut. He's this man's got to wait a year. If the thing breeds for a year, it's, he's got to wait a year. I mean, yeah, I, I imagine you can to just breed all of these before I even was saying I was going to be a business uh, by taking the time to realize that, you know, I, I research. Okay, why do these things cost so much? Oh, it's mm -hmm. how long they take to breed. Oh, because colonies crash all the time. 
Mm. Well, maybe I could uh, have better success using the living soil system instead of uh, the main uh, substrates that these people are using. Boom. I love the way you think. So these guys obviously uh, love the humidity a little bit more, and that's why you offer them this in the corner. Uh, and then once you realize if they're really into it, I give them maybe, you know, a little less than half the bin so that they can move around, do what they need to do. Uh, and again, take water as needed, but also have the ability to move away from that water system so that things don't get so humid uh, that things start to uh, have almost that kind of like musky smell. And I have noticed from other people trying to do this, that a lot of those individuals have that musky smell. And I think it's because they don't actually have anything living in the soil substrate. Boom. So just anaerobic things are building up. That's why it smells funky. Oh, hey, Brian, which ones are these? I like these. Uh, Gastroids. These are from Italy. Italy. And that's um, part of your biochar, Brian. The biochar, we use it in cannabis as charcoal filters, but it is an odor remover. It will draw in the odor. That's why you should have at least 2% biochar in there. These things look like little box turtles. They're pretty cool. I, I, I want these. These are going good. I'm doing a um, terrarium kind of with fish, and it's going to be kind of moist. And um, these might be perfect for that. So uh, for you guys, too, so these uh, the things you see, like that uh, gastroids hiding up underneath, uh, those are just basic egg crates. Uh, so it's, if you don't have the money for the cork bark, because uh, it can be pretty expensive yeah. if you have a lot of these things, uh, some people charge up to $15 a pound for them. Uh, so again, you know, do your research, don't pay anything over maybe 10 to 12. Uh, and if you don't have the money for that, then use these egg crates to start off with. They will also hide up like the benefits of the cork bark, but the springtails and the isopods will also eat it as a food source. So if you don't really have the money to feed them yet or you know, purchase things that are high in protein and calcium. It's just another way to be able to make sure that your isopods are alive and thriving uh, for very minimal costs. Most of those are about a dollar or less uh, for a pretty big crate. So that would go uh, probably three to four bins per sheet. So about a quarter per bin. Your springtails are popping in there, brother. Yeah, man. That was the one thing that I felt like I understood how to do when we were cannabis farming. I love uh, it. Yeah. All right. So, so let me show you guys. Oh, you have a question? Uh, how, yeah. How much uh, moisture and humidity do you, are you putting in? And is it relatable to, say, having keeping them in your cannabis grow where you're already maintaining moisture and humidity? Would that work with them as well? It will. As long as you provide, again, that hydration station, which is that sphagnum you see, that's the main stuff on the, the video shot there. As long as you sprinkle that within your fabric pot when you're growing in pots or you sprinkle that around. Um, and I would strategically probably spray it or sprinkle it away from the, the stalk uh, and then they will just move around as needed. Um, these will definitely not overpopulate. Uh, I wish these actually bred a little bit quicker. Uh, when people see these in the color, uh, they're, they're usually pretty uh, quick to purchase. Um, they are a little bit harder to grow, so that's the only hesitant usually with people that see them. Um, but yeah, the the weird coloring, the bright coloring is actually pretty rare in isopods, so this is one that sticks out. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to definitely oh, sorry, put me girl. down. I was just going to say, put me down on the list for a pack of these when you get them. I uh, hope to, to be like the seed man, you know, with these things. That's uh, so exactly. Yeah, Let me get a pack packs. of them gastroids. <laughs> exactly. are, are they on, on Daga yet? Cause you know, we could, we could be selling them on Daga too. I should talk to Peter about that. You know, I I've always been, um, you know, I, I didn't think that the community would really be into this. Obviously I'm promoting it because uh, we do the show without sponsorship and stuff. But when Marco said uh, that you got, you know, let's do isopods. And then um, when a few okay. of you reached out, uh, I'm just glad that some of you are as dorky as I am and uh, into this stuff because <laughs> it's pretty easy to maintain once you understand how to build a soil system. Mm -hmm. um, and then once you are maintaining instead of building that soil system, that's where you can take the time to improve things, get a variety of different uh, leaves and that kind of thing. Like we don't have Mongo magnolia leaves here in Colorado. Uh, so I reached out to Marco like, hey, man, do you think you could get these? Uh, and he was kind of teasing me like, why don't you? 
you know, why don't you go outside and get them yourself? <laughs> uh, so there's a lot of things that are like tip top things that you would need for breeding isopods that you might not necessarily uh, find locally. So again, that's where a lot of these expos come in where you can almost get everything you need under one roof. And as Duff Nug says, I love it when a plan comes together for a good brother. And brother, you're a good one, man. Appreciate that, guys. This is uh, something that's fun. You know, I can look, you know, again, with my kids and stuff and not have to worry about anybody uh, busting down the door for any reason. You know, and I, just think about, like, the way your kids are learning, you know, about life. And, you know, now this, you know, we grew up. And this was a bug, right? We saw bugs. Your kids are growing up. This is dollar signs. This is food. You know what I mean? This is this is dope. This is great, man. This is great. Paid the rent for 13 months, guys, didn't it? You know, he already said that. He's paid his rent 13 months in advance so he can go out and use his money for this. And it's making him money. It's it's. And he said, you don't have to worry about your door getting kicked in growing this. Definitely. Absolutely. And, and maybe about. this isn't for you, but the springtails, uh, like I said, man, I mean, those are pretty easy to reproduce if you understand soil food web. Most people are breeding them on charcoal or clay. Uh, yes, you can find success with that. But again, I found more success by getting very old decaying wood, laying it flat on a uh, springtail bed that has already taken off. Give it uh, 48 hours and you can come and start tapping a lot of springtails from that piece of wood into brand new containers. And that's how I've been doing it for probably about a year and a half for this business. Uh, and I used to do it with the avocado tech. Uh, that's another thing that you can do when you put that avocado down and things are really starting to break down. Uh, you will have so many springtails that you can move throughout your system uh, that you would probably never have to purchase them ever again. So it's an excellent uh, return on investment. Uh, when you get springtails and again that there's a variety of springtails so you can use diversity with those as well yeah so that is dope i've been doing that with uh rove beetles uh shout out to chef paulo uh taught me how to build a little rove beetle breeder pen box similar to this and um they really love that um actinobacteria and so they've really been loving like wheat bran and and I just bought some from him. I mean, I bought some from M uh, MI Beneficials who we're going to have on the show soon and uh, put them in there. And it seems like I'm getting, you know, more, you know, I need to probably do an official count or survey, but I can see that they seem to be happy and they seem to be thriving. So a lot of these things, man, once you get into them, you know, I'm always about it. I know, Brian, you got a business and I and but I got to say what I always say. I always work to cut out the middle, man. You know, if that's something you're passionate about or you're going to use a lot of, you know, it, it benefits you to try to do it yourself. And shout out to Brian and appreciate you for, you know, sharing a lot of these things you're, you're dropping on the people. So that tells you right there, the man has got good intentions when he's showing you kind of his blueprint and his puzzle, you know, how he's doing it. And but if you don't want to do all that, he's got got the product for you, too you know so it's a great great way to run a business in my opinion yeah yeah pyramid uh wanted to know uh could you just give a brief rundown on how you breed them and you basically already did but if you could go into a little bit more detail brian uh yeah so uh, almost every single one of them needs a little bit different uh some of them really prefer humidity. A lot of the zebras love everything being dry, but they also need a corner pocket of pretty heavy um, hydration because they don't seem to go into that corner as much. So learning each different species um, is, is kind of where a lot of the trial and error comes from. That's why a lot of people uh, try to do this and fail is because for the most part, if they don't have the biology in the soil system, like Ken always talks about, uh, most of them don't even know why they've failed. And so you guys have a leg up doing this because you understand that if I can produce and build up a, a, li a living soil system, and remember each one of these little bins that I have is its own utopia. Some of them have their own issues. Some of them are so easy, it's comical. Some of them that you think uh, should start breeding right away because that's how everybody says they are. Uh, they don't do that for you. Um, and so there's it's this this industry is so new that um, 
there's a lot of individuals that are just kind of breaking ground with this stuff, myself included, uh, the bio dude, a couple other individuals around the country that are understanding this stuff, Colorado Chameleon. Uh, it's all about the bioactive setups. Uh, that is the future of the reptile business. And for the feeder aspect, that's why I've created rubberduckyispods.com. Yeah, and it's all about the biology, and that's what the guys in the chameleon industry, they call it bioactive soil, but it's the same thing, and Brian has a lock on it because he's already learned how to do a bio, you know, active soil that's going to promote everything that he's doing. Yeah, the you know, it's built in. It's not added. You know what I mean? Like when I sell yeah. these, when he sells them isopods or whatever it may be, it's already built in. It's not added. Like I didn't, he didn't dump springtails in there and just started filming. You know what I mean? That stuff's built into it. And that's the, that's the great thing about it. Well, and you're, he's creating a, a, a string of life in there. And that's where things just slowly improve because of all the different variety as the substrate gets broken down it's creating more that the springtails not only can eat but it's creating more <laughs> biology overall and you're creating that ecosystem inside of the tank um or box or however you're growing it and if you have that complete system there you go it, it all works out just uh really nice you got a, a big tank there marco let's take a look well, that's what Duffel Bag was saying. He'd like to see it in a horizontal system. So this is um, a horizontal soil that I met, built. It's my little terrarium. It's kind of like an isopod setup and um, works wonderful, man. This is how I build my living soils. Same type setup. Sand filter on the bottom, gravels on up to A horizon and O horizon. So, yeah, definitely, man. You guys are on it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Having that, all the different levels of there, and it's all that complete ecosystem. As soon as you have that total ecosystem, you're going to see things popping up you didn't think you'd ever see because it's the, the material is there to create that insect, to create that biology. But if you don't have the whole, whole ecosystem, well, it's impossible to actually do that exactly it's a whole yeah so you gotta have them all you can't just have one part yeah yeah so this is somebody new brian uh yeah this is um to my understanding myself and one other person are the only people that have this uh it's called the platinum ducky um and it's extremely shiny like the the video won't do it justice but i'm going to try to get a, a zoom in on it here Uh, so again, this is a, I'm not going to be able to do it justice here. This is an isopod that um, is really the, the price point comes from the fact that no one has it. Uh, it's a uh, Cubaris. So when I say Cubaris, that usually means it's going to take a while to breed. So when uh, that the audience member asked about breeding, just know that if you're thinking Porcelio Lavis, that's going to be super quick, fast, uh, efficient. Uh, and if you're thinking Cubaris, that's going to be, for the most part, slow, um, but also very rewarding because it is so hard to get those to reproduce, especially these platinums, uh, that most people don't even have them anymore. Uh, so, again, this is uh, all skill sets that most of you probably already have. And then probably learning as you go, Brian. I mean, I would imagine, you know, if they have more food or if the food is an abundant you know, then they'll breed more. If the temperature is right where they want it, they'll breed more. You know, finding that sweet spot is probably, you know, the next level, in my opinion. Yeah, so I think you can only really see it from the back part, but these are these are extremely shiny uh, to the naked eye. Uh, and I think that's why, uh, like, hardcore designer isopod collectors um, really are seeking these is because they're just rare. You know, people seem to really love things that are rare. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say besides the shininess, uh, these things really do anything. Um, they're just pretty cool to look at because nobody has them. Okay. 
So what is the price point on those ones? I know you were talking some of the price point. You were looking at 10 grand for, for one bag of them. Uh, yeah. So m most people just talk about uh, heads. Uh, I don't even think a lot of people buy it wholesale. Um, so that's something else that my wife and I are trying to have more in the industry. Uh, but yeah, um, I would say these are probably close to $25 a head. So um, a five count or a six count. Um, we usually would sell, actually, we probably usually sell it for about 150 bucks for six of them. Geez, that's better than selling beans, man. Well, it's also, uh, those beans don't end, um, fornicate and make more beans, right? <laughs> it's just some of the, the beans take way, way longer than others. But if you see, I go out of my way to make sure that there's springtails. You can see them breaking down that egg crate, like I was saying. Yeah, there's a trail um, of them on that egg crate. Like, they're just rolling up there. And that is part of that secret sauce for rubber ducky isopods is we're using diversity. Um, you know, I had rove beetles that were really grinding through this, Marco. And that's something mm -hmm. else that I continue to have problems with is then after a few months go by, they all go away. Yet every now and then I'll still see fungus gnats in some of the bins where I know, like, well, how you know, there were still fungus gnats in this one, so it couldn't have been that they all, um, hmm. you know, the fungus gnats did their job. And I would imagine, from what I understand from uh, Matthew Sink Angel, uh, that the rove beetles eat the springtails, so there should be a food source for them. I'm not understanding quite why they seem to fall off, because at first they're at the same level that you see the springtails. Well, you know, I, you know, Brian, I, I look like how we're looking here and I, and I look a lot and I see, a, I've seen a lot of rove beetles just walk right mm -hmm. over top of and buy springtails and just like they don't even give a shit. So I feel like that there's an alternate food source and I think it's that actinobacteria. And I think the larvae of the rove beetle probably will consume that um fungus gnat larvae but i don't i don't really see the adults like eating a springtail i'm yet to see that okay well, i mean I, i'm not, not saying that. that they don't but i just haven't you know seen that everyone says that but i have not i've seen them yeah. as like walk right by you know so there you go that at for a moment there you could see like how shiny they are oh, yeah, like it, they are, they are like like a like a chrome polish almost. That's what they remind me of. Are they like a clear shiny? You know how some of them you can see into their insides. Is, there, is it that or is it like a silverish? You know, not it's like a silverish purple shine oh, okay. to them. Nice. Yeah, and they uh they really shine. So uh, yeah, if you're really into these, um, I'm not even selling these yet um, because that's how long they've taken to breed. So uh, I'm actually kind of giving you guys part of the uh, the secret sauce of stuff that's coming next year. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how long this stuff takes to breed. So if I have something okay. that's coming out this year, that usually means that I was working on it last year. So now if you want to make some money, go find it. Huh? <laughs> we put that one to a Jay-Z gold bar, Brian, because, uh, yeah, that's worth it, buddy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and... Um, you know, if you have a little money in your pocket, you know, I, I, you could probably do this too. You know, more the merrier, I think. Um, this is there's there's plenty for all because it's just just starting. Um, and like I've always felt, um, I I've always even joked with Marco in Vegas, like we don't have uh, like yacht money ambitions. So I don't, you know, I'm already taking care of my family at this point. So it's only going to get a little bit sweeter, um, and that's really all I'm after. So. Plenty of opportunity for you individuals that want to uh, farm isopods. The feeders is probably easier to start with. But, hey, if you like a challenge, jump into the Cubaris. Um, just know that you're probably going to lose a little money. You know, and I part of my background was uh, playing poker for a living. So that's OK with me sometimes as long as it was calculated risk. Um, and that's what I was trying to do is ship some of these uh, really unique ones from Thailand. Sometimes they made it. Sometimes they didn't. So. Uh, for the super unique stuff, you still really have to do that. Um, so there is a little bit of risk involved, money risk and all that. So just wanted to tell you guys that as well. It's not like this is some kind of quick, get rich quick thing, or you got to put a lot of time and effort into this. Um, but you see that the benefits take hold after a few years. Yeah, this is chess moves. Definitely. This is definitely chess moves. It's thinking ahead. What's next? You know, so if anybody's got the plug on those silver boys, you know, Brian's going to buy all you got. 
Hell yeah. I got a, a one that I personally think is the coolest next. So uh, we're going to check that out. This one is from Spain. Good deal. Good deal. Now, is this one going to be a little bit more arid in the um, region or arid in its environment? Are they all pretty much going to like that moist, warm environment? Most of the one, or actually all of the ones that I'm showing you, except for the dairy cows, love the moist environment. Um, and they're really unique. Like all of these things are pretty rare, especially uh, the ones that I'm showing you from this point on. Nice. Okay. Do you have some of this stuff on your website that I could bring up too? And I know you have, uh, you know, isopod care sheets that you have done for, you know, how people should be caring for the isopods, etc. cetera. Uh, so guys, all the information that Brian is sharing here is also on his website uh, and some of it in more detail on the, the care and management. But is there images you would like me to bring up after we show the, the next round there, Brian? Uh, no, I mean, maybe just on the website, we were fortunate enough to uh, be on the news because of how unique this stuff is. So I was showing them uh, some of the stuff I'm about to show you guys. Uh, yeah, and they had never seen it before. So uh, check out, um, I think it is like our um, Frequently Asked Questions page. Uh, if you click on that, it allowed me to have a link to it. And then you guys can see it was um, the news channel down in Colorado Springs. Uh, so check that kind of stuff out because uh, I'm very proud of that. Uh, that also creates what's known as backlinks. So if you are into building your own websites, you need to understand that kind of stuff, that putting in time and effort, you have to earn backlinks, especially from high-end um, domain authorities like uh, news organizations. But that is the kind of stuff that bumps up your uh, websites. So hard work. There is no other way to do it. Uh, mm -hmm. But that is part of the cool aspect of this is that if somebody finds your stuff important mm -hmm. or thinks it's worthy, mm -hmm. they will uh, link to you. That's called a backlink. And then the more of those that you get, uh, the more Google algorithm favors mm -hmm. what you're doing. So Definitely. if you don't know that, that is a super mm -hmm. Jay-Z bar because I had to watch okay. like 40 hours of videos to just really <laughs> understand that part. Yeah. All right, so these are the Bolivari, Porcelio Bolivari. Uh, these are, in my opinion, probably the coolest ones uh, outside of like the rubber duckies that made this whole thing a, a thing. You know, a, all we're seeing is your computer screen, brother. Oh, one second. There we go. Oh yeah, they're like ghosts. They look sweet. Yeah. So there's some babies. So for the people that have ever um, tried to breed Bolivari, you know that is such a happy sight. Uh, that can sometimes take a year or so. Look at all these babies. Boom. I don't know if y'all can see all that. So obviously that's the adult. And if you oh, can yeah. see the, the coloring and the size, uh, that's not the norm. Uh, a lot of the, the people breeding these things, they're not able to achieve that color. And again, it's not. I'm not doing anything magical other than having that microbial, that biology within the soil substrate, in addition to feeding them calcium and protein and, and fruits and vegetables. So having this uh, is fantastic. Um, these are seasonal, so this doesn't really happen too often, but if you get enough of them, it seems like it, they're not seasonal anymore because you have so many of them that they're breeding at a variety of times, um, but they don't breed quickly at all. This I think this bin I'm, I'm working on is just about two years old. And if you'll notice, they are not on my website. Hmm. What do you, um, you sell them by the t uh, head, you say? How many head do you like to have before you go ahead and offer it on the site? Uh, several hundred, because when we go to the shows, like if I had these at the shows, they would sell out probably within before noon. Oh, Usually oh, when right. I have the rubber duckies, those sell out almost instantly. They have this thing called VIP where people pay extra to come early. Uh, so we really play that up to the customers that enjoy that experience. And we will like offer them deals on some of the higher end stuff. They get the good stuff early. Yeah, I like that. Buying a little Yeah, time. I mean, if the customer's willing to pay extra just to come into the building early, you know, we like to hook them up um, and... We we're even doing these mystery bags and stuff that were a huge hit over the weekend. Great marketing, my friend. Great marketing. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you can see all these little babies uh, for you individuals that have never really 
uh, dabbled with these species, uh, it is possible to breed these. Uh, you just got to be patient, just like the rubber duckies. Well, our cannabis plant takes really, it grows really fast in comparison to the, the isopods. That's one of our reasons our soil takes so long to really get going is because it takes a long time for some of these creatures to develop in the soil system. That's where buying them makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. That's right. Buy yourself a little time. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, like each one of these is probably worth, you know, 25 to 30 bucks. So you guys can see that patience um, pays off in this game. Definitely. And I would love other people to do this so we could trade like we used to with the seeds. Because I would love oh, to I'm have about to get into it. I'm a, I'm on it now. I like this. I like how I, I, I like how you're doing this. This is great. I want to get a little collection going. Well, back in the questions, we had some guys uh, talking about fish tanks that they've got that are sitting empty, and they were wondering if it'd be a good idea to use the fish tanks. The fish tanks are uh, fabulous because they can't climb glass, so uh, there's really no way to uh, you know let them get. Um, Okay, get Brian. Dogs is in too, man. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, get get some species, and we could trade up. Because I, you know, I don't think anybody in this game can afford to buy all of them without trading a few people. Uh, the Cubara species, this species, is extremely expensive uh, to get a, a colony going. Uh, but at the same time, you guys can see how kind of unique they look. Pretty rare uh, isopod, obviously from Spain. Um, and just something that to people in the industry, this is looking at like a Rolls Royce or, a, you know, a very rare thing. OK, so and in, in, in that world, everybody would be like, oh, shit, he's got he's got them. Okay. Yeah. Or, or the platinums that I showed you. I mean, I know those aren't <laughs> as pretty as these, but yeah, right. the fact like that we that. have those. Y'all got them. I like that. That's nice, man. So what kind of isopod is that again? Uh, the Bolivari. Uh, it's the... <laughs> My wife and I joke that this is like the, the, the super bougie one. <laughs> People love to uh, put these in vivariums and terrariums um, and just kind of let them grow without a reptile in it. So it's almost like a fancy ant farm. Boom. And if you can get the colors to really pop, uh, which you can <laughs> achieve doing the soil food web, uh, people really notice that in the industry. Um, people that are hobbyists, it's kind of the same way, you know, when you're growing cannabis, uh, the the customer is now educated enough to know that bag appeal is extremely important, um, just like it was in the cannabis game. So to have these colors popping, those are my pretty trichomes, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Dogs is saying a collective that specializes in rare arthropods and cannabis. There you go. Love an idea. Hey, man, we're sparking their minds. That's all this is about. You know, give somebody a thought. And, go, and run with it. And it is all about caring, sharing, and community. That's one of the things we preach all the time. And this is caring about the community enough to share this knowledge and understanding that, hey, you can make money with this, guys. Come on, everybody jump on. Let's do this. But it's not easy. I want to, I want to stay like this isn't, I'm not trying to say like, hey, put some money into this and you're automatically going to take off with it. Um, because there are a lot of people that have tried this, even from learning this from me, uh, there's some other vendors that were trying to breed and now they don't even bring their isopods cause they just can't keep up. So I want you guys to know that it's not, this isn't like a turnkey thing where it's just like, Hey, I threw some shit just like in the cannabis game. Like some people think when they first get into it, that you throw a plant and some dirt and boom, everybody's riding around in fancy cars and eating steak dinner. Mm -hmm. And that's not true. And it's the same thing with this. Um, you're probably going to lose some investments with this stuff. Um, I've had to buy multiple colonies uh, before. I've had multiple colonies crash. Um, and again, I think that came from the fish flakes. And those were early beginning mistakes. So don't make those same mistakes. And you probably won't have those same issues. Uh, but yeah, the overall health of the isopod should really come from uh, the soil food web. Um, mm -hmm. And that is the gift that we try to give you guys each and every week is that once you understand that uh, there's a lot of doors that open for you and uh, now you need to kind of find your own niche and run with it. 
this can be very sustainable, you know, in its own in itself. You shouldn't have to be going. You don't go to PetSmart and buy shit for this, right? I mean, once you're established. You're no, PetSmart is almost yeah in the reptile world at expos and stuff. It's that's like kind miracle of like saying you're going to Walmart for your pet. You know, people are kind of they kind of turn their nose up at that. Exactly. That's why reptile expos exist is because they want you to buy a reptile that actually is well taken care of. Um, and from what I understand with Petco and PetSmart and all those, they only have so much money allocated per animal. So like if you just to keep it simple, if something costs, you know, they gave 20 bucks to it, but it costs 50 bucks to fix the animal. They don't do that. No, um, it's all money. It does seem like the reptile community, they actually most of them, unless they're beating their animals in front of kids, seem to really care about uh, what they're doing and. Again, this is kind of like their artwork, especially when it comes to snakes, geckos. That's really hard to achieve some of the colors. And then again, it's the same thing with the isopods. Some of these colors are really hard to achieve. So once you achieve them, people remember your brand and your name. Yeah, I love it. So is that your last uh, last display there, Marco? Or Marco, Brian, should we be jumping into questions here pretty soon? Or uh, I got three more. Let me run through them because these are kind of the coolest okay. ones. And guys, I, I've been saving your questions. We'll be heading them, uh, hitting them on the end. And we got some from Facebook uh, as well. And uh, great for you guys on Facebook to be joining us today. So branding is very important and that's very true. And that's where Brian has, is doing an excellent job of branding his brand. And uh, like, I don't know, in, in some organizations, lots of people, you know, uh, group together and maybe that's something that uh, we can be doing in the isopod world, like uh, uh, with Brian and dogs being in Colorado, they can work together. Absolutely. I'm down to work with uh, quality human beings. That's all. You know, I, I judge you by the content of your character. Um, this is something that I am very, very proud of. These are rubber duckies that are finally taking off. Uh, as you can see, there's a variety of ages in here from juvenile to adults. Uh, to go from juvenile to adult, it does seem like it takes about a year. Uh, so that's why when you see us at the expos, we only sell adults is our customers have more success that way. Uh, and that part has really started to build our brand uh, by guiding the customer when they're spending um, a good amount of money with us so that they're successful with these things. Uh, because once somebody buys a rubber ducky, they usually come back and buy more uh, just because of how cool they are. Uh, people just kind of fall in love with it. This is the, uh, the isopod that started off what's known as designer isopods. And again, these were discovered in Thailand in 2017. Zoom back a little bit. It won't zoom, it won't focus that good. Yeah, that's, that's great. I know you were happy when you saw the first baby of those bad boys. Yeah, the, the fact that, so remember these guys burrow. So the fact that you can actually even see this many uh, is fantastic. That means there's probably double that uh, buried themselves in the soil, reproducing. Uh, they just love getting dirty. So the, the ducks uh, love more of a uh, wetter environment. Uh, but again, Goldilocks <laughs> approach with that kind of stuff. We don't want it to get too wet uh, where they seem to explode is the only term I guess I could really say. I don't, I'm sure there's some kind of uh, specific term for that. But yeah, if they get too wet, it seems like it causes them to die. Their, their legs, their structure, the way they're built is even a little bit different. I saw that. It looked, they're neat, man. Yeah, so, um, you know, Marco, when I have uh, more time to prepare, when this was more of like uh, not just kind of filling in because somebody had to change their schedule, uh, I bet I could uh, set it up with a macro lens and we could really get some cool looks because this video yes. uh is not doing this thing justice no yeah i want to see where, where we could see the springs down there with them and everything yeah, yeah so i'll get a macro perfect. lens at some point yeah. but hopefully you can kind of see like it has that orange duck face yeah uh, yellow really duck good. and then the the brown body are they how, how big do they get they all they get about the same size as others uh i would say this is pretty close to the size of an adult uh 
and that's and about the you know average size of any other. They're not like smaller than regular roly polies or whatever. Uh, the Cubar species as a whole is a little bit smaller than like Porcelio, Lavis, and that kind of thing. Okay. Um, but they these are the ones that people um, go out of their way to kind of collect is the Cubara species uh, since you know all of them were discovered uh, at least within at tw in 2018 some discovered even just like a year or two ago uh, so there's a lot of things that could potentially be out there uh, that we don't even know about so that part is kind of exciting because if they found something else that was cool as a rubber ducky I mean that might be a whole nother wave uh, that that kind of pops off huh I'll be got cool. my eyes open. All right, I'll keep this going pretty quick, so I'll get the next one. But yeah, the rubber ducky is uh, the tried and true. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that one. Your first one, to be honest, uh, you're probably going to fail more than likely. Just keeping it, you know, honest. Hey Brian, so how does it matter? Okay, so when I get a new, let's say I get a new species, right? And I could just put it in my, you know, kind of soil mix. But then I may end up with some of my average guy isopods in there. How do you guys ensure that when you kind of set up a bin for, you know, the rubber duckies, that it's only rubber duckies in there? Uh, making my own soil. So during 2020, uh, tw the end of 2020, I started making my own vermicompost, uh, adding like, you know, uh, calcium, that kind of stuff. Um, and then really built that up. And now that's my soil substrate. I have bins and bins of it uh, that I use just even for my own business. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Uh, the next ones are the cappuccinos. And while we were setting that up, uh, somebody was also asking, also not sure. Oh, dog fight. Yeah, the the wife's letting the dogs in and out. And my boys just went off, so I'll hold off on the question. What well, you got in here? All right. Can you guys see those? Oh, the cappuccino. Oh, damn, they're sweet. All right, so these are super, super, super rare isopods. Um, there's more than two people that have them, but not many people have this many. Uh, and at one point, um, not anymore, but at one point, these were going for 150 a head. Enough said. Those are sweet. I like that. They look like they're breeding pretty good, aren't they, Brian? Uh, yeah, but again, this is two years in the making. So okay, see, look I at it. Ask how long. Yeah. Oh yeah. But you guys can see. I mean, the springtails are popping. I'm always uh, adding a little bit of extra food. Uh, can you go zoom back in on the oyster shell for me? Um, not the outside of it though. Is that there? Is that is that their poop on there, or is that just leaf stuff? That is, and um, that is right. another part of the the secret sauce. And when the babies take off, um, that's what they um, eat uh, for the most part. So when the adults defecate, the the little ones eat that, grow up, and then they start actually also eating more of the leaf litter, the decaying wood, and then the amendments that I add. Um, Usually every few days. Y'all know I y'all know I, I see my poop now. See all those springtails? There we go. So as yeah. those begin to really take off, you can just tap this into a new bin and then you know put this back and come back 48 hours later, boom, tap it into a new bin. Inoculate. Well, you see, they work in a symbiotic relationship with one another. Um, there's a lot of them there. I'd probably um, probably start to move some of these into some slower bins. Uh, again, this is another way that you can make a little money for yourself is just taking extra springtails and uh, selling them at expos and stuff. So I see a you lot got that pen oak money. leaf. Yeah, magnolia leaf in there, oak leaf's yeah. in there, um, some rotting wood, some old cannabis stalks. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, as long as there's no fungicides and pesticides, they're going to break the majority of that stuff down. This again, if they're protein hungry, though. Uh, you don't necessarily need all the leaves. I mean, yes, you need some leaves, but um, not at the same level. So uh, there's there's extra ways to fine tune this stuff where you don't even have to spend money if you're buying the leaves, which can get expensive. I mean, living soil builders, you're already we're you're already here. Like you know, you're you're halfway there, and then just now it's just adding that diversity of the of the isopods. Look at all that frass. Look at all that man. That looks great. 
all on that egg carton. You know, you could tear that egg carton up, shred it up, throw that in the soil. You know, this is great. Uh, so there's like a a uh, an adult and then like a teen. So you can see the size that they get to. Uh, and again, these are pretty rare. So um, also, I guess the cool part of this is when more people get them, you know, the market dictates the price comes down. Uh, I can't really see these um, going down too much lower in value uh, because they are so sought after. And more people are going to get into the hobby. So now's the time to be into something, guys. If you're gonna, if Ground you're gonna floor soon. opportunity. Mm -hmm. And see that coloring and all that? Uh, again, not everybody's got that. So um, the, you, I promise everybody watching this, if you've been growing cannabis for a couple years, you have the skill set to get these colors uh, at the same level that I'm getting them at. And the customer knows the difference. Uh, your, your customer really knows the the bag appeal, if you will, for an isopod. And when they see this, they, uh, they buy it. They, that's that calico look. Yeah. These are the cappuccinos. Yeah. I got that three color in there. That's sweet. All right. Let me you get know, the last I do one. Have one. One silly question and maybe I'm not sure Marco might be able to answer it better than Brian, but they're consuming the, or the babies are consuming the feces of the parent. Are you thinking maybe that's possibly to get the gut, their own gut bacteria going on it? I'm sure, man. You know, that, that only makes sense. You know, follow behind mama, eating some of her poop, pre-digested. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. Well, it's, it's, how it's like when it. a baby is, a baby is uh, feeding from mom, they're getting mom's uh, bacteria from her breast milk, putting it in their stomach, and that's how they get going in life. So yeah, that's I'm a thinking that's a good idea. Yeah. Huh. All well, right. That one's so, got a molt in there. So these guys right here are the yellow. I'm sorry, the white duckies, uh, and these are super, 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 super rare. And that oh. white one is actually a Japanese magic potion from Japan. Uh, oh. I don't really know how that one got in here, but uh, a little trickery there. Huh. You know, every now and then they might be like on my clothing or something. And so uh, I don't really notice it. I go to the next bin and it falls in. Um, that's probably what happened here. Mess around and breed something new. I wish. Yeah. <laughs> so these um, I've had these, I think, for almost two years as well. And they've barely reproduced. So mm -hmm. I hope that you guys could see that. All the cool shit, just like in life, uh, takes forever. So those guys there have been just alive in there a couple years. Yeah, I'd say about two years. They got this. Um, I went more with like a living mulch for them. Again, you kind of got to find the sweet spot for this stuff. Yeah. Um, and I don't necessarily think, just like in cannabis, that I could give you like some kind of playbook. And right. your environment's going to be the same as mine because <laughs> I have to keep up my humidity living here in Colorado. I would imagine if I'm doing this uh, with Marco um, out in Virginia, uh, mm -hmm. that I would have to probably find ways to maybe ha add ventilation or uh, maybe spray a little bit more than every few days uh, mm -hmm. because, um, you know, humidity is obviously needed in this stuff. And um, in Colorado, it's pretty hard to maintain. Yeah, I bet you're probably doing a lot of lids with you know breathable lids, and then that then your issue is trying not to get it stale in there, trying to keep some airflow. I can I can see the issues, but yeah, out here it's so humid in the summer, man. It'd be perfect. Wait, how do they do with temperature? Like I'm up here in Canada, so my winters get pretty brutal. How like if I lost heat for an hour, am I gonna lose all my isopods? uh that could happen yes i there's even been some uh, major players in the industry recently uh that moved and had to tell the community that they lost like 80 percent of their stuff uh, because they put it in a storage uh, facility where the uh temperature wasn't regulated damn this yeah. this is a very finicky thing um so I, you know again i know that a lot of people can do this i just want you guys to know that it's not this isn't easy, um, and I don't want anybody to think that. But if you can farm cannabis, you've been successful farming cannabis, you can find a way to do this too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. 
And that's the one thing with a cannabis grower. We know we have so much to learn just to get the cannabis plant going. We learn the living soils and now we can have isopods and just let them grow. And in the future, we can sell them. Yeah. Yeah, so you guys can see like every one of these has springtails. Every one of these has um, red wigglers. Every one of these was at least inoculated with rove beetles um uh swarsky and californicus so uh, as as far as i could tell uh every now and then i will see a fungus gnat and that shit annoys me and that makes me wonder what's going on with the rove beetles but for the most part um i don't have that issue and i know that is very hard for people to figure out um and i love sharing that with the community but with some of the individuals um i don't even share that with them because uh, <clears throat> They're so misguided on how to take care of stuff that I don't even want to like help them out. So I love uh, sharing with people that are good hearted, but if they're malicious in a way, um, you know, I, I just don't want to share that information. Yeah, I don't blame you. Yeah, exactly. We want to promote people that have the right uh, moral code of ethics and kick the other ones that don't out. And we are open source, but when you're working on something, sometimes you don't necessarily have to share that while you're working on it. And you don't, you have, you know, you haven't yeah. quite gotten it figured out, but we forgive, you know, forgive you for that. <laughs> well, and considering the knowledge that we bring on is generally the, you know, a lot of cutting edge information that's just being released. People have to understand that's rare information. That's one of the beauties of this platform. That's right, Ken. You're right about that. Oh, that's beautiful, Brian. Oh, yeah. yeah. All right. So I think you guys kind of get the, you know, what I've been up to and, and seeing things. Um, and then again, I hope that you guys find your own niche. Maybe this isn't, you know, I had to really, to be honest, I had to talk my wife into really understanding that these didn't get out and they weren't like roaches and they don't smell and all that. Uh, so maybe your wife wouldn't let you do bugs, uh, but maybe she'll let you do springtails because those don't necessarily get out either. Uh, grow. Snakes plants micro, yeah microgreens whatever whatever it is if you know how to do soil there is something that you can make a little extra money at and if you turn that into a real hustle it can become a business for you yeah yeah so is that just uh kind of uh, uh something you picked out of the forest because it looked like uh um you had some uh, uh oh geez moss in there uh, just live moss. Uh, I can purchase that from uh, like high-end garden centers here in Denver. Okay. So do you want to hit some questions, Brian? We uh, we got just yeah. over half left and we're at 34. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you guys can see okay. how Okay. It... So we'll go with uh, Jay. You can't buy worm-filled living soil from the grow store. I, I believe he's um, like saying it like a point, like uh, like yeah. biofilm, all the stuff that comes from um, composting worms. The fact that they're going to build those dissolved oxygen channels uh, and carry a lot of those springtails and rove beetles for you. Uh, it makes me feel warm and fuzzy at night because I know that things are continuing to improve. Uh, and that really makes a difference for me. Learning how to do a lot of this stuff is like, OK, if I'm going to put time and effort into understanding this, watching videos, you know, especially back then, it was a lot of, uh, you know, hour long video for maybe one gold nugget or two. That's why Marco, myself, Leighton, Peter, Ken, everybody that's a part of the show, Chad, when we were uh, thinking behind the scenes on this stuff, we wanted to make sure that we were giving people a lot of information, a lot of experience, gold bars, uh, because three hours is a commitment. And we understand that. But to really have a candid conversation, it also sees, seems like that is where you are su successful in podcasting is talking to someone for that long, uh, because we always joke, you can't fake the funk. So if someone's um, not willing to come on the show, which has happened to us in the past as well, Marco, where they realize it's live and you know, part of that I respect. And then sometimes I think it's because it'd be pretty hard to bullshit uh, the three of us for three hours, you know? So yeah. uh, this community is badass because the people that are involved in it are genuine and they want to help uh, each and every one of you guys. Um, and that is something that is really awe inspiring for me because this shit has gone international 
Uh, and so many people have such a different skill set uh, that we are learning each and every week uh, by just coming and journeying this. Uh, I love to call it a church now. This is uh, something that I look forward to each and every week. Yeah. I mean, look, I think people will dig just the like I got a micro cam, too, and just we can just the views down low, you know, weekly isopod checkup when we don't, you know, things like that. What's the soil doing? Because if you're like me, I sit there and I just look and I know you sit there and look in your bins. I know you just watch those isopods, just checking them out, seeing how they're moving, seeing how they're living. What are they doing? And people that watch this show, I think, like shit like that. So I think we should do a little more of that kind of stuff. You know, soil check ins and discussion on what things, you know, just like we do, man. I think this is a great show. I like, you know, the amount of different topics we touch you know what i mean we're damn sure diverse in what we talk about we talk about a little bit of everything but we all got a little bit different background too you know so we bring some different things to the table like my man is the plug on designer isopods you know like this presentation like dude brian i've known you for a minute now and like this presentation really sinks it in now like i totally get the whole concept now so i really appreciate you you know showing your stuff man and dropping all these little nuggets bro appreciate it yeah man yeah. and um you know we, we i try to do it in living soil and in cannabis and the reality was i just didn't have enough money of my own so that i could kind of control things so that shit didn't go sideways uh but that's the cool part of this stuff maybe you know my dreams are obviously set super high maybe farming cannabis really isn't in the stars for me uh, i realize that now um, but I can control this aspect because I'm in, you know, I can fund it myself. I can do it myself. I don't need anybody to help me along the way. And that's why I think I'm so committed to this. And it's taken off like a rocket ship is because it is my baby. I've just had a daughter. I can't I burn the ships. I'm on the island. I can't sail back. Boom. I like that. I like that. Hey, and guys, you know what? And I, I, I'm sorry to jump in, Kim, but so. We've had guests in the past tell us, man, like, think about it. When the big, listen, I just watched something. We had a guest um, uh, drop some knowledge about CRISPR, the DNA shit. Everybody knows about that, like how they're manipulating plants. He said the plant can be covered from fucking stem all the way to tip with trichomes when, the, when they go federal. So point is, like Brian said, just mastering growing cannabis might not be sustainable because things could you know it, it could make it to where the market is so we you know it's so you know difficult for a solo you know person to make any money so you have to diversify you have to think okay well what else is associated with cannabis that people are always going to want or even growing plants or like he did outside of plants and went to reptiles you know and then blending them both back together so to me, like business and it's all mindset, man. Like it's once you get that mindset and you start putting pieces of puzzle together and then you make pieces and you're growing the pieces and then putting them together, it becomes a real tight fitting, uh, you know, piece. And, and you can really dial in and, and you're doing something you love. You know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cannabis can be a starting point for breaking off into a whole bunch of other businesses, guys. Think outside the box. Don't just, you know, regulate yourself to one position and one way of making money. Look at anything that's possible. And a lot of things don't have to cost you a lot. You can raise worms and sell them. doesn't have to cost a lot. Right. And, yes, CRISPR is bad. I get that. The point I'm making is some things you can't control. So if you see a train coming behind you, what are you going to do? Stand there and say, Oh, well, are you going to get the fuck out the way and still make your own lane and get where you're going to go? You know what I mean? So things are not going to stop because we know they're bad and we say they're bad. My point is, you know, they're going to make it on a mass scale where they push so many trichomes out there, you know, then it, it'll you'll just you can become obsolete. So we're just saying diversify. So that's all I was getting at with yeah. that. And I see it's good. Now y'all getting on the DNA rant. I don't want nobody to get all on that. We didn't want to get too sidetracked, but. That's where I was going. Last week was sidetracked. This week we're still on, you know, partial living. So I lost the tracks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, how about this one? Roly polies are bad to have or good. 
uh, again, it's going to matter about what isopod species you're working with. Um, if you're getting the basic rays in the backyard, in my opinion, they're going to be more detrimental to you, what you're trying to achieve than the possible benefits that you could achieve, especially if you've never had them before, because most people don't realize, man, even sometimes it feels like a couple of days uh, and those just take off. And if you haven't noticed them, they're, you know, underneath a few things, all of a sudden they're on the stalks, like uh, Marco had mentioned. Um, so if you're seeing that, then you're, you know, you kind of missed the boat by a few weeks to minimize that. I think you should focus on captive bred isopods and those are extremely beneficial. Um, play around with them in your worm bins first. Uh, and then once you kind of got a grasp for it, um, you know, run with it because then you can add the millipedes, um, the springtails, the rove beetles, the isopods, they're all working together. And it seems like when that stuff really takes off, that's why I, I was showing you guys, you know, all my different bins. I still look at those as all their own little utopias, but at the end of the day, or, you know, a year, two years, however long that takes, they should all hopefully eventually start to look the same, have a lot of diversity, but have that super soft, uh, almost like velvety soil. And that's coming from the composting worms. Okay. So next one, Brian, what is easy for new home grower to get? Not rich either, but do my best for my girls easy to get as far as an isopod i take it i would assume that's what we've been talking about all show okay just making sure because some people ask me about seeds a lot and i i answer with isopods and then they get like what, what the fuck <laughs> so if if i were you and i wanted to kind of play around with stuff i was a new grower there's a thing called the florida fast um they are isopods that live up to their name as far as their reproduction rates um and as how quickly they run around um, and I would play around with those. They're uh, extremely cheap for, for what they can achieve. They clean things up. They break things down. If you have a reptile, they also are part of the cleanup crew. Uh, so a little bit of springtails, some Florida fasts. Uh, and now you have a, a pretty, pretty cool little system that will uh, start to attack that defecation within a few hours. And then as that system starts to build up, uh, when the animal defecates, it seems like the isopods... Uh, kind of just know that somehow, especially the dairy cows, and they will all emerge on that and break that down. Uh, a lot of people um, now when they're breaking down, like they killed an animal. Um, again, the reptile world is a little, you know, there's all kinds. Uh, so people are now killing animals and then selling the skulls, um, deers and stuff that are overpopulated and stuff. And they're using dairy cows uh, to eat the flesh off of the bone. So there's people that are now even coming to me saying like, hey, I just created this business. I'm breaking down. So that might be something else for you guys. If you're really into hunting, the dairy cows supposedly will eat all of that flesh off of the bone so clean that you can then sell it. Uh, and supposedly this lady like carves it uh, and then sells it on Etsy. So, again, there's money in anything. You just well, got to be a hustler. Well, yeah. does, tell me if this counts. I got my tooth pulled. A few months ago and then i was like man this thing looks gross but i wanted it cleaned up so i stuck it down in my soil and let the um springtails and everything they cleaned every scrap of blood and the tooth came out looking nice so i get it wow <laughs> that's wild dude yeah it's wild man i don't know if i wanted that image in my head mark thank you thank you <laughs> hey the soil will clean it think about it <laughs> just like he said and people and you know they've been doing that they used to use these beetles like um uh, like carrion beetles to also do that but dairy cows must be really um efficient at doing that if they're using them to clean that skull like that interesting uh is old sourdough bread valuable for composting any special microbes or yeast in there that are good for soil that would be a Marco question. Yeah, all that. You know, anything like yeasty, you know, think about when we make our MO3s, you're, you're growing yeast, you know, that's a big component of your soil. So, yeah, if I was going to um, have a sourdough cultures, I'd definitely throw that in my compost, let the worms go, go to town on it. Okay. Yeah, not only will the worms go to town, but springtails. Uh, and if you don't have that stuff, you can buy nutritional yeast, uh, just a little sprinkle here, a little sprinkle there. Uh, away from the the water side of things 
uh, and that is a fabulous uh, B vitamin complex as well as protein. Um, and that, that'll really help beef up the soil food web. The, the worms seem to turn a little extra purple. Uh, the springtails are popping. The isopods just look bigger and colorful. Um, and, and that's why we, we even joked to made the product that we sell called the, you know, a, a beast yeast feast uh, because it just beefs up things. So uh, that's another thing that I'm going to play around with rove beetles with is maybe uh, playing with yeasts. Uh, maybe I should play around with sourdough bread. Yeah, yeah. Well, sourdough is really healthy for us, just like anything that is fermented. The fermented foods are already broke down by the biology, which makes it more easily biodigested for our biology to use in our system. So the next question, uh, so guys, I've been putting like banana peels, all kinds of fruits, uh, that parts that can't eat in or uh, that you can't eat into a bucket and putting the filtered water in and letting it sit three to seven days and feeding it to my plants and I'm doing right by them by doing this. Yeah, that's a Jadam, JLF. If you're using fresh bananas like that, though, are you having fungus snap problems? Because I've always, playing around with bananas, uh, I always had issues. I don't know, maybe, maybe fermenting them there would be an, a better example of doing it the right way. Well, he's doing it too fast, like JLF, two weeks minimum, you know, six months, even better. Like, think about how long it takes a banana to break down. So what are you doing in seven to ten days or whatever? I forget the time you said. So you could actually get be throwing your soil out of balance by doing that concoction. And then if you're not testing it, you don't know how strong it is either. So JLF can be pretty strong. So I would just time is better when you're doing things when breaking think think of breaking down think of microbes when is a banana when can a microbe eat a banana think about it like that it has to get into the water it has to break down yeah now i think they'd probably be better off instead of a gel f with the uh, nutrient just a straight nutrient solution with the potato that's that's going to be your few days uh so let's go uh is hard to get a pip jam i don't know if it, is that an isopod i i don't know what the question really means so honestly i've never heard of pip jam before so i don't know what that means okay well maybe rephrase well, that jeff <laughs> uh we'll go to the next question lucas uh, i got two questions if possible unrelated after you make kombucha and it's done fermenting the first ferment, do you put a closed lid? Oh, we actually answered this. We talked about this already. Okay. I didn't read far enough as in the question, so we'll go to the next one. And Oh, and that's uh, part of the same question. So we're going to Browns. Uh, hi, Marco. Question. I have several one to two year old buckets of old Bakashi from organic food scraps to dispose of it. Dispose? Hmm. That's not a good word because that's what you got is gold in those buckets. You need to be. Um, all right. So if you're going to if you got a garden area. If you're not gardening, but you might have an area you want to garden, bury it out there. If you got to get rid of it, if you got to move it, if you have a compost, put it in that compost. You know, if you can just put it behind the back of the house and the behind the garage and forget about it, it would still be gold for you whenever you can get to it. But don't dispose of it. You probably use the wrong word. I would think so. <laughs> Uh, Squishy Mirror, any advice on getting rid of slugs? I'm using diatomaceous earth, but I don't want to harm my work, my works and other biology. I will. I can chime in there real quick. My uh, bearded dragon eats all of those for me. Uh, I just put them in the bin real quick. Keep an eye on them. Uh, I never put them in the high end bins, but like a dairy cow bin, if there's something uh, and he munches on them, hunts them down. Sometimes they're up on the wall. Uh, he runs over there and eats them. Um, and I think I think that's a, a solid investment when you start to play around with these things is to have some kind of reptile. Uh, from what I understand, like um, other reptiles will eat them as well. But my personal experience is from bearded dragons. That's a good one. Using Mark, bio. Anything to add? 
Yeah, using that biology to take care of biology. I like that. Um, I, you know, for slugs, the best way I've seen is um, I just try to um, capture them with beer. Obviously, people try that. The problem with slugs is they lay so many eggs. And I actually noticed slugs in one of my indoor beds. I had some small pots. I was just sitting on top of the mulch, letting them veg. I picked them up just looking on the bottom, and I saw some slugs under there. I'm like, oh, okay. They haven't messed with my plants, but I took those. Whenever I see them, I throw them outside. Like, I just get them out of there. But I've heard people say copper is good. Um, you can buy, like, those copper Brillo pads. And the, what I've heard people say is you can take them and kind of tear them open, wrap them around the base of the stem of the plant. And as long as you don't have leaves which are drooping down and touching the soil, the idea is that you shouldn't have slugs that get on your plants anymore. Um, I haven't had to try it because I haven't had the issue, but I've got the Brillo pad. So maybe if somebody in the chat knows or Brian or her or something. I believe that's even an old school thing off of Overgrow. So that's a OG bar right there for sure. Okay. Yeah, I've had the Brillo pad forever. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't heard that one yet. So, yeah, that's that's an old uh, – it's not bro science, it's actual science. Yeah, that's well, actually – I would say bro science, science, but it's not – I haven't heard anybody in the like coat world say it like that, but I've seen a lot of people like Marco saying uh, that are in the trenches and the, their experience. Um, uh, same thing with CDs when you're trying to keep birds away. People mm -hmm. say that shit doesn't work, but if you talk to people that have done it, they say that shit works fabulous. Yeah, it's one of those yeah, things. Yeah. And see, they've I've also because one thing, one property of copper is. Um, you know, they used to make all door handles out of copper because copper has antimicrobial properties. So one thing about it, they say the slugs do not want to, you know, run their foot over that for that reason. So that makes well, green sense, table is saying they can buy actual copper tape now and wrap it around the stem base. OK, so they've done they've taken that what used to be. Well, there you, like now, you know, it's not bro science. If Boom, they ran with and it works. Yep. There you go. Yep. Yep. Okay, well, we'll head to the next question. And another one for you, Marco. Mm -hmm. I'm finding black soldier fly worms in my red wiggler bin. Should I be concerned about that? I wouldn't be, but you know what it tells me? It tells me, well, you got it outdoors, which is fine. But it tells mm -hmm. me that you probably were overfeeding that a little bit. See, the, the black soldier mm -hmm. fly will come in, which is, I like black soldier fly, but if you overfeed, you'll turn that whole thing into a black soldier fly bin. You could, you know, so back off the food, let that all sort itself out. Those adults will fly off. It'll be all good. And maybe it'll get back into balance is what I would do. And what am I smoking? Just a cigarette, man. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, Nothing Lord. special. <laughs> I will send me some CBD and then I'll be smoking the CBD. You know, hey, uh, that'd be better for me anyway. <laughs> hey, let's reach out to Dreaming Farms. That dude's got some fire ass CBD. Boom. There we go. Was smoking on that, and I was like, "Did you?" Okay, Chad. Chad, copper has to be thick, or they will arch over it. Aha! Uh -huh, I like that, Chad. They are ass. Okay. All right, good stuff. Well, we know copper is good for our system. Like you, they got all these products that you put on for you know pain when using the copper. It's got to be part of the electrical field, I would think myself. Why is Chad not on here in the fourth box? <laughs> 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 Should I send him a link? But uh, he would come on. He hasn't fixed his hair yet. That's hey, since late. you brought that up, Mr. Chad, will you, will you please respond to us in the text message? Parker <laughs> and I were trying to reach out to you. We'll make an we appointment. <laughs> hey, hey he also, like, shout out to Chad show? putting together uh, some of that content, man. That, that shit was fire. I was able to watch the Danny Danko or in the um, JJ one. <laughs> I, I need to be hung. Yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. Okay, man, okay. I know, man. Peter's not gonna like this. <laughs> and, and Chad, he was on the uh, London show yesterday. So why wouldn't uh, you know? He should be on your guys' damn rights. You know. That's why we're bringing it up, Ken. Our feelings are hurt. Good, good, good. Nice. Okay. Uh, Operation Annihilation. Are they transplant or are they those spots? I'm seeing. Um, the transparency say, of the isopods, transparent, the see through. Okay, transparent. My mistake. Uh, yeah, some of them can even uh, they look really cool under a black light. 
but again, it's going to depend on the species. Uh, we have a poster that we sell that has over a hundred different isopods that are considered designer. Uh, and like I said, this is just starting. So uh, there's so many different isopods that I don't think we really understand all of what might even exist. And this might be something where we go into the caves. <laughs> um, liar. Chad, <laughs> no, he's been busy. He's a busy man. Busy man. We've We're got it busy. recorded now, Chad. You got to get back to them now. <laughs> no, we miss you, buddy. Glad you're uh, doing stuff. Yeah. And uh, it's really cool to see you, man. Yeah, I, I, love, yeah. I love when, like, all this other stuff's going on on the channel because – it's just then it's a, like a real community, you know. There's yeah. so much shit going on. So isopods, if they're carnivorous, does that mean they poop out? Uh, I'm not even gonna try to pronounce that. That's chitinase. Chitinase. Okay. Uh, I wouldn't. I use insect frass as the chitinase, and I use black soldier fly larvae as that insect frass. Uh, when they poop it out, like when you saw, it's kind of that rectangular thing. Um, and I don't necessarily know if that has a ton of chitin in it. What it does seem to have is um, what is needed to get the babies to grow. So I would imagine it's diverse uh, in the poop. Um, that might be something that we need to talk to like a bug expert on is what's really going on there. But that's also from my understanding, same way with the red wigglers that the, the isopods are improving stuff. You know, most people, when they defecate, you know, it's disgusting. That stuff is being removed where when a red wiggler or an, I, I, I believe certain isopods, when they defecate, it's actually benefiting everything involved. Uh, they you know, when the, everything's going through, it's, it's cleaning up that process. Um, so that's something cool that I hope to be able to go down a rabbit hole on somebody that knows way more about that stuff than me, because, some of those things in the reptile world also seem to be maybe potentially bro science. So I got to wade through that, that aspect now too. But um, yeah, when they're defecating and they're defecating at that level where you can see it, that is a thriving community and you should pat yourself on the back. Okay. So in, in my case, Brian, I'll just kick you in the butt from over here. Instead of patting you on the back, I'll kick you in the butt. All right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what's the cost for those dairy cows you're selling? Hit the website. Yeah, or if you hit me at the expo, uh, it's a lot cheaper at the expos, and it uh, comes on my soil system. So it's um, we're not allowed to ship the soil, but it, if you're at an expo, I got it on that soil system. We sell a hundred for forty dollars, fifty for thirty. Hmm. There you go. Aren't they one of the oldest organisms on our planet? From what I understand, yes, some of them that were even found deep in the ocean. I've been to a place that you could see the individuals across the restaurant had ordered one of these as like a delicacy. Um, and they were maybe six or eight deep. And this thing was huge. And from what I understand in the restaurant that we were at, that must have cost a an, an crazy amount of money. But it was the experience of eating something like that. The way they described it to me uh, was eating it, you know, when the high-end restaurants, when they bring the fish out and the eyes are there and the head and everything, um, that's the delicacy of it. But I don't know. They ate the last one. Like, you ever seen that, Marco, where you go to a super <laughs> high-end restaurant and a $100 fish and it's got the head on Man, it? Man, I, I bought a $300 lobster before by <laughs> accident. $100 fish. On my, mama's birthday. So, yeah, let's get, a, let's get a, one of them lobsters for the table, too. It's all good, but then they brought the bill out. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> okay, who died for that lobster, you know? Because that's a heavy one. So the the big ones in the ocean, from what I understand, they were around like in the dinosaur days. Oh, yeah, they're old, man. They're old. Yeah, okay. Just, you're eating a dinosaur in Vegas. So Alton wants to know, are you tilling for an initial setup for a garden? So... Marco, I was think more you. No, I don't. I um I start putting down organic material like leaves, and then I go to cardboard. I go right on top of the soil, and then I start yeah. building the soil from there. Some people do that initial till, but you know, think about it. You can till when I, man. When I was a kid, I used to till. Like I had neighbors, I till for them. Three hours of tilling, till, 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 till. 
And then within like a, a week, the plate, the thing was full of weeds. You know what I mean? So it's like, why did y'all really pay me to do all that tilling for you? You know, and you I, killed I, the stability. Yeah. You know, we know now not to till. Obviously, I was a kid then, but, you know, it looked that good black rich soil for about two weeks. Until it soil rains. Food. Yeah. Soil food webs gone when it rains, nothing but rocks. And right. so, no, I don't like to till. I leave what's already there in place to start building on top. Yeah, absolutely. And building your uh, your soil system from the top down uh, seems to make a lot of sense uh, being proactive and stuff. Uh, so, well, if you're not disturbing the soil you. system because that's their universe and you're building the soil system on top, they're just going to move up into it. You disturb them. You're killing a whole bunch of them. They got to start all over. So, yeah, it, the least amount of tillage, the better, in, in my opinion. So, Boom. yeah, you're the manager of the system. Yeah they, yeah, they shouldn't depend on you whatsoever. <laughs> so those uh, beep are good for the soil. Do they hurt the plants? Uh, just if you're using the ones that you usually find in nature. Uh, so you so start to study isopods where they're captive bred, uh, meaning somebody with uh, some knowledge bred them for you, um, so that you use the correct isopod for whatever you're trying to achieve. And that yeah. was the point of him showing all that diversity, guys. There's there's one for every situation. But if you notice, there are a little like some had a lot of bark, some had a lot of leaves. Um, and so that's also what uh, takes time and experience. And I wouldn't say that I necessarily could say like this is this for sure. Or, this is this for sure. It's just when I start to see them breed. And that is the hardest thing to do um, is to look for a year in a, in a little bin and never see a baby. <laughs> wow <laughs> yeah we think the cannabis plant takes a long time yeah man <laughs> but see that's a long game you're doing you're living life you know that's going on over there they're, they're trying to breed but you're checking them every day but you're living life making other moves yeah. not like you guys don't be frozen there guys you know what i mean go on about your business let the isopods do their thing you know so. yeah you uh, were talking about avocados earlier, and you had switched to uh, um, the not pecan seed, not um, pistachio seeds, pistachio shells. Shells, That's really, yeah, yeah. Uh, so with the avocados, um, you usually want the ones that are protein, fat hungry. So, again, that's where the dairy cows come in. Uh, the springtails are gonna love that. The um, um, what is that? The it's not orb. I always say orbital, dude, but it's oh, not. The, uh, well, you got the orbited mites and then you orbited. Have, yeah. I always say the wrong shit, man, because that's how I learned it. But yeah. yeah, so that little orange mite, I, I don't know what really is going on there other than it seems to, to indicate to me that things are popping off. And once I started to, I mean, you don't want it those to really, because they can kind of over overpopulate. So I would just move them same way with the springtails. Uh, but once those things start to take off, I add a little bit more decaying wood. Things kind of progress, maybe weeks, maybe months. That's when I actually start to see fungal bodies. Uh, so I don't know if that mite has anything to do with that whatsoever. But through all my little utopias that, I'm, that I got, it does seem like when those appear probably from diversity and compost, uh, now I'm starting to actually see a lot more fungal aspects build. Um, and, I, and I hope that's true because that would be a pretty cool uh, thing to replicate. It makes sense, man. I always see the, um, yeah, I'll see the mites bloom, then the springs will bloom. And they'll both kind of settle themselves down. Maybe it's the predator prey model. You can't have much of the one without the other. Yeah. So, uh, Alton, I have a bunch of aquariums. What can I do with them repurpose? Uh, you can build a soil system in them, the terrarium, vivarium. Um, you can breed isopods, springtails, jumping spiders. Uh, a lot of those things are pretty easy to do, especially um, if you really dial in the jumping spiders. I, I guess there's a bit of a learning curve, but um, from what I understand, that's uh, relatively easy to do if you put some time and effort into it. Um, so there's a lot of things out there that um, if you understand that soil system, you can build in those uh, aquariums sitting in your garage or basement. Oh, you're muted, Marco. 
Mm. And don't forget, you can set one back up to um, get your aquatic microorganisms, you know, set the fish up back, you know, if you really want to. Yeah, yeah. So um, the isopods that you sell, are those actually, they're, they're found in the wild, but uh, they're bred in captivity for what you're doing. But are they generally, like, would I find them in my environment up here, I think? Uh, you would find certain species, like uh, the rubber duckies are only going to be, or to my knowledge, the rubber duckies, the white duckies, those are only going to be found in the caves of Thailand. And that's what, again, it's kind of exciting about this is all, obviously all of those caves haven't been searched. So who knows what the hell's in there? Uh, that's kind of the, the fun part of it. Um, but the Cubara species as a whole is um, something that I think uh, more individuals would have fun um, farming cannabis with. I, th I think they're just pretty unique looking. It's like when you fall in love with a praying mantis and you play around with that. This is just yeah. something else that I think you can add to it. Um, and some of these uh, live for like two years, three years. Um, and, you know, other uh, isopod breeders have proven that by isolating one and keeping it for, you know, a long time. So that part I think is pretty cool too. Some of them are pretty intelligent. Uh, others seem like they're more like cows, like they just, you know. <laughs> There's, there's, I, cows are pretty stupid, yeah. Praying mantis will eat them bad boys, though. Imagine that you're praying mantis in there eating your um, to a point, duckies. yeah. But if they get like the dairy cows get big enough where I've seen they're they're almost too heavy for the praying mantis, and okay. it's a full adult, uh, but yeah, if they're babies, mm -hmm. but again, at the same time, man, I would rather have the praying mantis eating the isopod because the isopods reproducing or at least the dairy cow species is reproducing at such a high level that it can be a food source and mm -hmm. that's why we sell it as a food source that's also eating the defecation and the animals shedding because i didn't realize when you breed snakes how much they shed and how often you have to clean that if you like own like a pet store or something uh, mm -hmm. where these guys will just eat it in like a couple hours so boom you don't got to pay your labor you don't have to pay your uh you know your your sales team uh, to do that that's definitely a gold nugget man nice i, I would have never thought of that you know for for a snake breeder to get isopods just to eat that especially the dairy cow that's the one and that's what i mean there's certain species out there uh, that we can guide you in uh, if you have some kind of specific thing that you're trying to do uh, but most people come to us either for the designer aspect you know they want something bougie that no one else has or uh, they're coming to us for the feeders because they're so much bigger and their stock can start off to where now they can feed a variety of reptiles uh, from that one main bin. Okay, okay. So um, what do you guys think? Do you all think there's money in selling um, fermented fish amino acids? Because it does That's take Marco a year. Right there, bro. It takes a year. Well, it takes a year. All right, so start today. And then in one year, yes, you damn sure can. Thing is, the thing with FAA, though, is um, you got to do it correctly. You know what I mean? Shipping can screw you on that because, you know, that F, that's a liquid. That liquids can be tough. FAA, if you don't do it right, it's still active. It'll blow your bottles. You know what I mean? So take your time. Make your FAA. Bottle it up. Set it on your shelf. Make sure it stores. Ride it around in your truck. Just like the post office would do, leave it in there for a couple of days and test your stuff, you know. But yeah, there's money to be made. But then once again, like we say, like I say, if you're doing it for the dollars, then you got the wrong intention going in. That's kind of how I look at it. You know what I mean? You're going to do better off by saying, how do I make great FAA? You know, if, if that was your question, then, I, then you're on the right track, in my opinion. Yeah, if you're already making it, you know what the hell you're doing. All you want to do is make a lot bigger batch, and then you do have some for sale, I think, is probably more what the point was. Yeah, yeah, you can do that, but my point is make the shit correct. And do, yeah. you know, don't just put it out there, because some people cheat on the time on that, too. It's like, damn, oh, another year passed already, huh? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's time to bottle out. Yeah, it's ready. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, I always uh, wondered that, Marco. That's a good point, brother. Yeah, and you're or the, or the breeders that come out with 30 different uh <laughs> genetics, you know, every right. few months was like, damn. Well, damn. That's yeah, a lot of work, bad. bro. Right. That's a lot of work. <laughs> so um, is the amount of humus created one rolly a day? 
or how much amount of humus to create one rolly a day? I don't really understand that question. How much uh, poop? How much does one? How much does one eat and poop a day? I think is what he's saying. One isopod. Like is there that like varies with it, with every species okay. um, to get the amount of poop where you can kind of see it with the naked eye. Um, that takes a lot of roly polies um, and imagine and remember everything's like breaking that stuff down. Um, but from when I what I have found is they kind of hide in the bark and then they love to eat the protein and the calcium. So if you add that in addition to, you know, strategic um, leaf litter that's decayed strategic wood that's already been decayed like if you just added a bunch of new wood a bunch of leaves that you just got um i think people also find um issues and and some probably have colonies collapse because everything's too new so it's just like they're all just running around people have lives if you're not doing this for a business um you know that's where most individuals fail is the is the water aspect uh, they just forget two weeks Go back to the isopod, especially if it's the cubaris, um, and they're going to be dead. I mean, that's almost guaranteed unless you have a soil system and that kind of thing. But if you're if you're doing it, if you're breeding or trying to breed cubaris with most of the information on the Internet um, and you're not staying laser focused, uh, especially the first few weeks into it, uh, they're going to die. And that's why most people go out of their way to be excited when they see them is because most people um, just don't have success with them. Almost like a seedling, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's the Dr. Grin spoon, dude. It's worth a shit ton of money, but like only one dude's got it. You know? Right. We, we, we tried it though. So Jake, Jake, <laughs> Jacob, I'm really curious why, uh, why web spinners are not more widespread uh, use because they really contribute to the soil food web and add a layer of protein or protection. They create a layer of silk. And then I feel like that is so I have, oh my goodness, I'm having trouble reading today. Uh, I read so, this earlier. Um, yeah. Because then I feel like I have pots completely covered with these things and they have galleries where all their young are like, it's like an ant farm, but basically, Basically, an insect that looks like a road beetle. Blah, blah. Jeez. Um, so, are you I, spiders? I, there are soil spiders, and I see the little tiny ones that are a little, little bit bigger than mites running around there with the um, road beetles as well. But I ne never webbing like that. That webbing that you see on a lot of our stuff is like the mycelium we're going for from the fungi. I think more individuals are using jumping spiders because they want to move away from the webbing. They want something that's more of a hunter, like a praying mantis, that's going to stick more into the ground. Uh, remember when the praying mantis are popping off, um, you know, they first start out as brown because they're down in the soil. When they become a teenager, these, this is most of the species. When, when they're a teenager, they turn pink. Uh, so they're going to hide out more in like the lower stem area. So you can kind of strategically play this stuff out. And then when they're adults, especially when they're like strong adults that have probably killed a other couple other praying mantis, uh, you can then take them from plant to plant and they will be like a little watchdog, if you will. And as long as they're separated enough and there's food, that's why I still, you know, would release certain things, even ladybugs, because they will eat that ladybug if there's nothing else. Uh, you know, if you're if you're doing proper IPM, you're probably going to have to introduce beneficials to keep the praying mantis alive. That's right. Okay. Yeah, because y'all see, I got to take mine out to the um, JLF bucket, let her eat some flies. There's not no press, no, no pr uh, pest to eat. <laughs> and that's another cool uh, insect to play around with if you really want to get into that this summer. Because, you know, as things progress later in the summer, I mean, pest pressure, especially if you're newer to farming, you're going to more than likely experience that. Yeah. Uh, and it's fun watching those videos, Marco, just sitting there watching this all of a sudden snap. Right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, that thing's pretty cool, man. And it, and it literally will sit on one plant for weeks. Oh, yeah. So um, have you tried growing any plants like cover crops in your isopod bins? Uh, absolutely. I got a beta version right here. I'd say this is beta 1.0. I just did a chop and drop. I did a talk. Um, maybe like three or four weeks ago where I let all of the uh, 
cover crop grow up extra. But if you guys can see on the right hand side, I just have uh, clover uh, in the middle there. I have pitcher plants, um, a cool thing that I found in Savannah, Georgia, that kind of reminds me of home. Uh, and this is kind of more what I'm just playing around with now, uh, using cover crop to see what happens. I do have <laughs> mid-grade designer isopods in there. Uh, so there's five different species, and it seems like for the most part, they're all thriving and doing well. Oh, that's nice. I like that. Yeah, good stuff. So all that's new as well. Like, I don't, as far as I understand, that's the first, um, like, dedicated uh, bioactive isopod bin that I've ever seen anybody do. Uh, so I have a lot to learn. Um, and that's why I'm encouraging other people to get into this if they want. Like the hustles, there's plenty of people to hustle this. So I would love to be able to trade genes, beans, genetics uh, with other individuals that, uh, you know, I've known for a long time. So if you guys want to get into this, uh, especially the ones that got a little money to get into the Cubaris, uh, I think we could trade and um, cut down costs, you know, for the community. And I'm always down um, when it makes sense for both sides. Yes, sir. All right, well, what time is it? What, what, what time is it? Mm. All right, let me answer that. Um, so you got to really, um, you got to stay focused with that. Like if I'm doing like an orange koi or something, uh, every now and then there'll be solid blues that appear. I will feed that to my bearded dragon. Um, yellow zebras every now and then you'll see like a, a white one pop up somehow. The genetics just kind of change every now and then. Uh, so if you keep up on that, uh, your your gene pool will, will stay true. Uh, and if you're selling a lot of them, uh, what I've learned is that every now and then you got to buy from somebody else that you trust so that bloodline say, stays strong. You're muted, buddy. You're muted, Ken. Sorry, my dogs were yapping in the background. My cat came down to visit and the dogs always bark at the cat. Go figure. <laughs> So do you want to keep going, Marco, or I think you pretty much had her for the day, brother? You're oh, muted. No, you're muted. Everybody's doing the mute game. Yeah, I, I had an early start. I got a bit four today, so I'm, I'm, I'm good. All right. I, mean, I, I can run through these questions, uh, but then I need to run as, go, as well. Oh, you got more questions? How many more questions we got? I got nine, nine more. Oh Lord! All right. I, 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 there was a hundred and thirty uh, something, so uh, we won't go through that many. One hundred and thirty questions. Uh, almost, oh, yeah. Lord. Yeah, lots of people like isopods, Brian. That's awesome, man. That's a whole other world, especially yeah. uh, if somebody needs to get into those jumping spiders. Because from what I understand, there's like hundreds of those too, species wise. Cool, cool. Uh, so scabers are good um and they're quick breeding so again just kind of stay on them but uh, i love using that um taking care of my uh, bearded dragon's tank i probably have 15 different species in that one just to play around with uh, and he you know he scratches the surface it's usually porcelio scavers that are running around and he's eating those or, or porcelio lavis uh, he's eating those as well so again having diversity in that um, every now and then I sprinkle some calcium and feed it to him in like a bowl just to make sure he's getting enough calcium. Okay. Yeah, those are cheap and easy. Also, not sure if you already mentioned it, but I'm just tuning in. Can you explain how to set up an isopod home with a fish tank? So the simplest answer to that is I would watch Marco's uh, video with the soil horizon uh, if I hadn't already set up my fish tanks, I think I would use that system. I have lava rock on the bottom. I have cardboard. I have sand. But I don't think I had this, the right amounts uh, for what I really needed because most of that seemed to already disappear uh, from the bottom end of it. So I would watch Marco's video. Uh, probably also watch Layton's videos on the soil horizon. Uh, and then you would have such a better viewpoint on what you're trying to achieve and then, you know, having a bunch of different ones to start from, you can kind of start to see what creates a utopia for what species. Uh, and then you're off to the races. Then it's just experimenting, uh, figuring out things for yourself. Uh, that is, you know, no one's good. That it, with isopods and how this kind of works, you got to think of this as at the beginning of farming cannabis. 
Like there's really nobody out there that's going to hold your hand and tell you how to do this. There's very few people out there that have videos of any, that's any merit. I feel like at least in this, this point of when things are moving towards bioactive, you know, you don't want to learn about something that's they're building dirt. You know, that's a waste of time. Or in my opinion, that's a waste of time uh, because the, the whole future is focused now towards bioactive in the reptile world. Uh, and that's, you know, that train's coming. Definitely, definitely. So I can't pronounce that. So where are they from? The cappuccinos are from Thailand and the caves of Thailand. Almost all the cool Cubaris are from caves in Thailand. Uh, there's, from what I understand, many, 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 many more caves uh, that people are discovering. Um, and the, I guess the weird part about this, too, is there's only so many people in Thailand, I guess, that know where all this shit is. So it kind of goes back to just a few plugs. It's on that old man's land over there. It's got that gun. I could not imagine going and scooping this shit up and selling it for like a hundred bucks a pop. <laughs> yeah, but uh, what do they get over there? <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, it depends. Uh, I mean, it's not like they don't know the market. Mm. You know, they got but the they, internet. They're more willing to do wholesale, but that's not. Um, there's a lot of risk with that. So you know, yeah, a lot. Yeah. A lot of them die on an international ship. That's why we can't even ship internationally. It's just because the success rate goes down from like 9.5 out of 10 to like 5 out of 10 just because of the customs and all that. And then when it's, it's still considered a live animal, so it has to go through like an extra process. So by then, most of them are dead. And they're all jumbled around and stuff. Um, I've, like, I think I started at the beginning of the show talking about that. The guy did it right in front of me. So if he's doing it right in front of me, I can only imagine in the back end how those guys are. Yeah, they don't care. <laughs> so uh, you already, uh, on some instances, uh, answered part of the question of how long do isopods live? Uh, but do they cross breed? Yes, yeah, some of them can. Um, some of them have found success with that, uh, like uh, taking a Dalmatian to an orange Dalmatian. Um, but then like the dairy cows won't breed with the orange Porcelio labus to get like an orange dairy cow. So again, there's not really a ton of information or concrete stuff uh, where I can give definitive answers other than, yes, that is possible. There are a few species that do it, but it does seem like, like I can't put a Cubaris, like a rubber ducky with a uh, pack chung and create this like super pink faced rubber ducky, uh, even though I guess uh, several people have tried it. Um, so there's a lot of experimentation that still needs to be out there, especially for individuals that understand breeding more of maybe like from like a dog level or something where you really understand genetics. Um, that might be somebody where you could ask questions, um, for, you know, for the bugs. Okay. So um, are isopods and cockroaches related? I'm uh, not a hundred percent on this, but I don't think, I don't know, I guess, because from what I understand, the isopod is a crustacean where the cockroach is more of just like a land bug. I don't think cockroaches came from the sea. Um, okay. Yeah, I have, I have no idea on that one. Uh, so how uh, compatible are different isopod species? Do they ever attack each other? Uh, so they're very compatible. Like I, I said, I got this, uh, I got this tank here with five different uh, designer isopods. Um, and they're all living in a symbiotic relationship with one another. If I put the dairy cow in with the higher end designer ones, I do think that they would bully them. I do think that they would take food away from them. Um, so that's why I would never add that species with it. So again, these are, you gotta really understand what species you're playing with. Otherwise I could see that happening. Like if I put dairy cows with rubber duckies, I think my rubber duckies colonies would crash. Okay. Well, that's good to know for anybody that's really looking at getting going. They better have that basic understanding of what they can put with each other. Yeah, You want to play around with the cheap ones first, um, and, unless you're just crazy, I guess, and start shipping them. Uh, you might have, you might find success with that, but uh, yeah, it's there's a bit of a learning curve when you go from the basics to the Cubaris. Yeah, yeah. 
So could you use isopods to break down cat and or dog poop? From what I understand, most uh, like manure, uh, but I think that it has to decay a little bit more. So you would have you would want to use springtails with that. If I just have isopods in my bearded dragon bin, I noticed that it took days, sometimes uh, multiple, like almost close to a week uh, for the isopods to break that down. Where if the springtails are there uh, and more of just the microbial life from just adding the compost every every few weeks, um, then the process is broken down within you know a day or two at, at most. Um, so I, again, I think the alive and thriving utopia is where you want to set your goals. And once you're there, that's where you're not going to probably even see the animals defecation. Uh, you definitely uh, the smell is is minimized drastically. And we have one last question out to Marco. Are you going to pop off fast? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome, dude. <laughs> That's a great question. Yeah, I'm going. <laughs> Are you? <laughs> I imagine if he's asking that, he's like, if yeah, Marco's going, I'm going. Re reach out to me because I don't, y'all might recognize me. I don't know everybody. So grab me and say, what up? But don't hey, I flew out to hang out with Marco and I ended up laying in the grass uh, during a concert. So, you know, and yeah. I feel like a, a pretty heavy smoker. So uh, I got to throw this on. one in because I switched back to live comments. Uh, what do you mean by designer? Uh, so that's the term that people have called isopods that cost a hundred dollars or more. Um, they don't necessarily have the same purpose of like, you know, 50 rubber duckies more than likely aren't even going to touch uh, the manure. You know, they're just a different isopod on, on that point. Yes, some of them would be just because they like to break stuff down, but they don't necessarily like, it doesn't seem like that's part of their, what, what's the right word? It's not like they're programmed, but they're, you know, they're, it's not their preferred, you know, food. It's not, yeah, I know what you're trying some to say. Some of them are like, yeah, some of them are more programmed to, go after manures than the ones it seems like in the caves. Um, and that might uh, probably just through eons of time, you know, they seem to like humidity, uh, the, probably the microbial world. And then me sprinkling a little bit of calcium and f fruits and vegetables and stuff around. Well, hold on, Brian. I just thought about something. Do you think um, bat guano might be the missing ingredient on the cave dwellers to speed their breeding? That's a good point, man. Because that's the only manure in there in a cave, really. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, I've, I've been using the crab meal, uh, and that stinks to high heaven. Um, and I know the, the bat guanos because my wife, but I might have to tell her, hey, it smells like money. Marco was telling me. Put a put a sprinkle in the corner, and if they go to it, that's your money. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point, man. I know there's uh, like seabird guanos and uh, Peruvian guanos. There's a variety of those things that you could probably yeah. play around with. But the seabird, you know, wouldn't be in that cave. So go start with that. Yeah, good point. Yeah, yeah. I like that. Well, right. you think what other manure are they going to get in there? It's not like you're going to have a cow or a rabbit going that deep into these caves to defecate. So you're bringing a, a, a microbe that or a biology out from a cave that's never seen that. They're going to be looking at it and going, okay, it smells like shit, tastes like shit, but what kind of shit is this? <laughs> that's very possible. Yeah. Anyway, guys, um, I think everybody's pretty much ready to go. Oh, yeah. my wife is telling me I have to scroll back. There's something. Okay. Cold fertilizer making bunnies and furry fun friendly critters. <laughs> Brian's lion head inspired us to get our top ear or lop eared bunny, uh, <laughs> Michael Jack's bun. <laughs> <laughs> and white glove left paw appreciate it. One white glove. White I like that. <laughs> awesome. Bunnies are in a weird way become such a joy in your life. Uh, it's kind of silly when you tell people that you're going to go buy a bunny, but I think after they come to your house, uh, you can see it running around. You know, it's just uh, they kind of get it. So hats off to you. And I know Marco, I uh, watched your Instagram, buddy. Uh, yeah. It seems like you got yours healthy and doing what they're doing. Uh, poop in i can't imagine uh you know what that's going to become down there because that is 
Yeah, I've been layering gold, it up. How do, you, how do you, you want to say that? You know, comp. It is like the the catalyst for all of that soil food web is just having that manure breaking down. We'll definitely um, show when I harvest the lasagna of poop and IMO this fall. Right on. Oh, right on. Yeah, that'll Appreciate be one to look forward to. All right, y'all. Yeah, I'm glad you guys are interested. Uh, you know, sometimes when you geek out with stuff, you don't think that people would even care. Um, and again, this was short notice, so. Uh, if you're really into this, I guess, let, you know, give me a thumbs up and stuff and I'll go out of my way. Probably have my wife help me uh, so the camera works a little bit better here. Uh, I know that we got some macro lenses and stuff where you guys can really see some of like the Sabas. They got this gold flake, uh, but you can't see it unless you're using a macro lens. So the macro would probably open up the real world that's going on uh, in these little utopias. Yeah, it'd be nice. Yeah, we'll plan them out and give, give you all some good content like we always try to do. Thank you, Brian. Um, great info, man. Like I said, I've always dug it. I got it. But today I really, it really stuck like the full package of what you're doing because, you know, like we said, man, living soil is kind of the basis of it all. And the biology is the key. So um, this is just another avenue, another branch on that tree that, I, you know, that natural tree that we're all rocking on. So with that said... Since we don't know how to leave, I'm gonna go ahead and count it down. Ken, you got anything to say? <laughs> Brian, you good? Uh, catch us tomorrow with Layton. He is in Maine. He is uh, hanging out at a place called The Barn. Uh, they have asked to get, have him be yeah. there all day. We will be streaming live from 1 to 4 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, so look forward to that. That's going to be cool. I'm going to be on the road, so I'll be definitely checking out that whole thing. Good stuff. Yeah, I know. I was I was looking at that going, oh, yeah, we need to do that. Definitely. Uh, don't forget, uh, we've got a lot of other shows. We're going to have Joda Herb after Brian Layton tomorrow night. Um, we've got Alex on Sundays. We've got Chris Guerrero almost every day. Um, we've got Elka. The, the list is so massive, guys. Check out all the other shows on FCP one, but don't forget about FCP zero two. There's a lot of great content over there. Listen to many voices, choose what's right for you and never stay in the box. Jump out of the box and learn, learn, learn. Yes. Sir. And with that, Marco, did you have anything that you, Oh yeah. OHN time. OHN time. Okay, well, we'll dab out with uh, Brian doing a dab and Marco doing a dab of OHN. <laughs> <laughs>